All right. Good morning. The January 12th Board of Directors meeting is called to order. First, I'd like to ask our interpreters to explain the access to interpretation. Good morning. This is the announcement from the interpreter. To use the interpretation feature, please scroll to the bottom of the screen where the meeting controls are. Click on the interpretation icon, the world, and select English as your language. If you're joining through the Zoom mobile app, cell phone, tablet, etc., please press the ellipsis, then interpretation, and then choose your language. Finally, click on the mute original audio to not hear the original Spanish audio in the background. Headsets are available for interpretation if you are in the meeting room. Please check out a headset from the receptionist in the lobby. Aviso por parte de la intérprete. Para hacer uso de la interpretación, del servicio de interpretación, favor de desplazarse a la parte inferior de la pantalla de Zoom donde aparecen los controles. Haga clic en el icono de interpretación globo terráqueo y seleccione Spanish. Español. Si está utilizando la aplicación móvil de Zoom, celular, tableta, etc., presione los puntos suspensivos, luego interpretación y luego el idioma. Si no desea escuchar el audio original en inglés en el fondo, por favor seleccione Mute Original Audio, Silenciar Audio Original. Contamos con auriculares disponibles para el servicio de interpretación. Si es que se encuentra en la sala de reunión, por favor de pedir auriculares con la recepcionista en el vestíbulo. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to go ahead and start with our tribal uh, acknowledgement. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the land we call home. The tribal nations of the San Diego region have historically faced injustices. We acknowledge the harmony that existed between the land, nature, and its original peoples who have since endured displacement, persecution, and systemic oppression. We pay our respect to the unceded territory and homelands of the 18 tribal nations in our region, the most in any county in the United States, from our four cultural groups, the Cumia, the Guiño, the Luiseño, the Cupeño, and the Coahuilla. This land uh, has nourished, healed, protected, and embraced them for many generations in a relationship of balance and harmony. As members of the Sandag community, we acknowledge this legacy. We aspire to learn from indigenous traditional knowledge and experiences in undoing the injustices of the past. With that, please join me with to the, with, um, the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, Thank you. Um, Tessa, can you please confirm uh, quorum? Thank you. Good morning. Yes, we have a quorum with one agency absent and 18 jurisdictions present. Wonderful. All right, with that, I'm gonna wanna welcome everybody at back and I hope everybody uh, had some time to rest and reflect uh, over the holidays. Uh, a couple of we have a couple of members that are um, new, so I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves so that I make sure that I don't miss anyone. And I know I'm going to start off with kicking it off for our, our newest advisory members. This is a position that both Supervisor Anderson and I uh, created uh, that is very important to us. So just uh, if you could just say your name and the new uh, position that you're representing. So Robin. Good morning. I'm Robin Joy Maxson. And I am the chair of the Association of Planning Groups, San Diego County. We represent the 513,000 unincorporated area residents of the county. I'm here with my alternate, Eileen Delaney. And she's from Fallbrook and I'm from Ramona and we really look forward to working with Sandeg. Thank you. Thank you. Everett from Caltrans. I, Everett, you wanna introduce yourself? Good morning, Chair. Uh, I'm Everett Townsend. I'm the Interim District 11 Director for Caltrans in San Diego and Imperial Counties. Uh, as everyone knows, Gustavo Dayardo retired at the end of last year. Uh, so it's a pleasure and honor to be here at the board, uh, continuing our partnership with, uh, with board members and with SANDAG and those in the region. Uh, I uh, do also have an alternate I'd like to introduce is Roy Abud. Roy, if you could Roy uh, is acting in the role of Ann Fox, who is uh, taking up an assignment in uh, headquarters uh, as our deputy director for uh, planning and modal programs. Uh, and so, uh, and we also have members of our exec team in the in the room. Uh, 
kind of ensuring that uh, you know Caltrans is committed to our our partnership here with the board. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I'm missing the representative from oh, Lemon Grove. Lemon Grove, yes, council member. Sorry. Hi, Allison Snow, uh, council member in Lemon Grove, uh, best climate on earth, and and second alternate, and none of the other two are available. So, I'm excited for this opportunity. Thank you. Wonderful to have you here. All right. Um, so we've uh, we have a couple of items. Uh, we, we're looking forward to first and foremost working with all of you, and excited about the year ahead. Uh, wanted to give you a couple of updates. Um, so we've changed the agenda a little bit, but one thing that we we wa I want to make sure that continues to be at top of the agenda is the non-agenda public comment. So we're going to go ahead and turn it over uh, to Tessa for the non-agenda public comment. So that's a change on the agenda that was put in the wrong place. So I just want to make sure that everybody knows. Uh, I want to make sure that we are consistent with that so we can hear from the public first. And we have a process where we do uh, five folks who are here and the five folks who are um, online, and then we're going to go ahead and move forward. So I'll turn it over to Tessa for, I'm sorry, five total, non-agenda public comment. The other the other one is what Thank we you. did at the county. Yeah. Yes, yes. The first five non-agenda public commenters, Robert German, Dan Summers, Michael Brando, B. Mitter Miller, and Corey Schumacher, you will be called at this time. The following non-agenda will be taken at the end of the meeting. Allen, Truth, Consuelo, Blair B, Ramona Rosas, and the original Jaw and Paul DeBolt. Robert German, please go ahead. Good morning, Robert German. Uh, Citizens Against Gillespie's Expansion Low Flying Aircraft. I have a handout for everybody and for the public. EPA determines that lead emissions from aircraft engines cause or contribute to air pollution. Aviation is my, uh, my hobby. We have 18 cities, 16 airports. That doesn't include Tijuana, doesn't include military. I'm gonna take a couple of quotes out of the handout. The science is clear. Uh, exposure to lead can cause irreversible and lifelong health effects in children, said EPA Administrator Michael Reagan. Aircraft that use leaded fuel are the dominant source of lead emissions in our air. With today's action, the Biden and Harris administration can move forward in the process to propose new standards to protect all communities from the serious threat of lead pollution from aircraft. Lead emissions from aircraft are an important and urgent public health issue. Protecting children's health and reducing lead exposure are two of EPA's top priorities. Lead exposure can when have your time has expired. on congenitive next function, including- Dan Summers, please come to the podium. Sure, thank you, your time has expired. Wow, one minute is tough. Dan Summers, please come to the podium. Good morning, Chair, members of the board, take a breath. I'm here to thank you. Uh, I'm from the Ramona Community Planning Group. My name is Dan Summers. I'm here to thank you because you applied for a sustainable community uh, grant from Caltrans, and that will help State Route 67 with a great deal of technology. I'm also here to thank you for providing a new seat at Sandag for the 513,000 rural county residents that previously had been unrepresented here. Thank you for that. And third, I have some very good news for you. Uh, two nights ago, the Association of San Diego County Planning Groups elected Robin Maxson unanimously to represent them here. I have had the privilege of working with her for eight years. You will find her to be very bright, very prepared. My wife says that she's about five times brighter than I am. Um, and- uh, Dan, your time will, has expired. She will effectively Our next represent- Our commenter, Michael Brando, please come to the podium. You will be followed by B. Mitter Miller. Uh, but I take offense. I take offense to that. I, I really take offense to that. I don't know what political games people want to play around this stuff. I don't care. I find that very offensive. 
those who are expressing narcissistically always blame the other people for exactly what they're doing. I'm going to bring this up again. Brown Act, consistently being violated. Omissions. Speakers that do brilliant research like truth brings up a topic, and the moment Nora Vargas doesn't like it, she interrupts the person. We only have 60 seconds to talk, and then we get interrupted. How rude is that? The trash newspaper, San Diego Union Tribune, did a hit piece. Now, I wonder if Nora had anything to do with this, trying to paint us all as disruptors. When, when you watch a county board of supervisors meeting, she is the one consistently violating people's rights. And Elo Rivera, he was actually laughing, taking delight in truth being interrupted. That's called schadenfreude. Your time has expired. B. Mitter Miller, please come to the podium. You'll be followed by the final commenter, Corey Schumacher. Good morning, Chair Vargas, board members, and Colleen Clemenson as our new interim CEO. My name is B. Mitter Miller. I'm a volunteer with San Diego 350. The California Air Resources Board has issued an urgent warning. If California does not significantly reduce vehicle miles traveled in the near future, the state will not be on track to meet its legally binding 2030 and 2045 greenhouse gas reduction targets. Doubling local transit capacity and service frequencies by 2030 of, of existing networks would meet that target. <clears throat> As members of the board, you have the ability and the responsibility to make sure that the next regional plan meets the greenhouse gas reduction target and thereby, <clears throat> and thereby protects San Diego County for future generations. Our children and grandchildren are the ones who would suffer. This board can set an example for other MPOs to follow in the form of a regional plan that focuses on the fastest methods of carbon reductions while also focusing on equity and health benefits. Thank you. Our final commenter, Corey Schumacher, please come to the podium. Good morning, Honorable Chair Vargas and board members. My name is Corey Schumacher. I'm here in my capacity as the political director of IBEW 569, representing 3,600 union electricians and power professionals. Today, I'm here to say that along with community partners such as the Environmental Health Coalition, San Diego 350, Mid-City Can, the San Diego Housing Federation, the American Federation of Teachers, other labor unions, and Casa Familiar, we are thrilled to inform the board and public that our measure to fund San Diego County transportation, infrastructure, and safety projects, otherwise known as Let's Go San Diego, uh, has qualified for the November 2024 ballot. This means that San Diego County voters have the power in November to fund crucial road repairs and safety upgrades in every community in our county. This included in these funds are critical safety upgrades to fix aging bridges and rail lines in danger of collapse, expanded transit with a rail connection to the airport, and the preservation of open space and habitat. To learn more about the benefits of the measure, we invite folks to visit letsgosandiego.org. Thank you very much. And that concludes the non-agenda public comments at this time. All right, so thank you. So as you can see, we went ahead and moved uh, the consent items uh, to the bottom so we can have a little bit more of time to do um, our thorough um, presentations and reports uh, from my colleagues, the team. Uh, but before I give you my year review, I just want to say happy birthday to Robin and to the first vice chair. The birthdays were yes. yesterday, January 11th. So can we just give him a big round of applause? I'm going to spare you from singing because we want to have a wonderful day. So uh, with that, but Betty's complaining. Uh, and so with that, um, just want a couple of updates. The CEO, rec CEO recruitment process, of course, everybody knows that Colleen uh, is officially here. Her first official day is January 16th, but the team has been working very closely to make sure that the transition is smooth. So appreciate her leadership and the work that's taking place. Um, regarding the CEO recruitment, uh, the position, I think everybody knows, has been advertised earlier this week. Uh, early in the weekend, then um, CPSHR has posted information about the role on a number of websites and have emailed more than a thousand potential candidates. Uh, next week, Pam and her team will start reaching out directly to individuals uh, they believe are qualified for the role. Applications are due on Friday, February 23rd. Um, we're going to continue to pass along updates with all of you, um, as well as Pam, our recruitment process uh, uh, um, person, uh, so that the recruiter. Uh, can provide information to all of you. So I um, want to make sure that you all have that. 
In addition to that, I think last year we had a very successful um, uh, planning meeting. It was a two-day planning session or strategic planning session. I've asked the, the team uh, that this year it's only a one-day uh, board member retreat just so that we are uh, focused on um, staying close by. So we're going to have the retreat um, at Southwestern College and we're gonna, I'm going to bring you all to the South Bay. And, um, and and you'll see the beauty of our of the other piece of our county that is amazing. And uh, Southwestern College is the jewel of South County, just in case you didn't know. And uh, we are going to be asking feedback and information from all of you, but it'll be a one day a one day meeting and uh, make sure that you clear your calendars. We'll get you the dates. It'll be before the first the end of the first quarter. And so your participation is extremely, extremely important. And I think it laid the framework for a good year last year. So I wanna make sure that everybody is part of it. And then uh, quickly, I wanna make sure that, um, like I mentioned, we made some changes to the agendas just to make sure that we everybody has uh, plenty of time to take a deeper dive on some of these issues that are really uh, important and pending for all of us. Um, with that, um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over for the 2023 year in review and the 2024. No, 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 that's, that's fine. Right. It's okay. So, uh, but I want to make sure that I just remind folks, um, you know, the we had um, already a lot of um, comments and information. And so uh, just a reminder, right, that uh, we are trying to have a civil conversation. Every one of your, um, my colleagues that is here, um, you know, their opinions and, and your recommendations as you represent your communities is extremely important. And so, Again, uh, we're going to ask the members of the public to make sure that uh, they we are reminded that loud, threatening, profane, or abusive language that disrupts the orderly conduct of the meeting is not going to be tolerated. Uh, any language or any other disorderly conduct that disrupts, disturbs, or otherwise impedes the orderly conduct of the board meeting is prohibited. You know, you have one minute to speak. I really don't want to remind you to stay on topic. Um, I know that you, you know we continue to have this conversation. We have a wonderful year ahead of us. We have a lot of really great work to do. So if you could just, you know, stay on topic, agree to disagree, fantastic. Um, if one minute is not enough for you, feel free to send us emails, um, information. There's other ways for you to communicate with us as well. But please stay on topic on the agenda items and please do not disrupt the meeting. If you disrupt the meeting, after I inform you three times, you will be asked to leave the meeting. And so I wanna make sure that that's very clear. And so, um, uh, the amount of time allowed for each verbal public comment is determined on the number of agenda items and the complexity of the items. And so based on those factors, public comment will be also one minute. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to the 2023 year in review. Uh, I wanna thank the SANDEC team. Um, we went, went ahead and uh, sent an email to all of our colleagues, to all of the SANDEC team in December. But I also wanna thank our community partners and board members for all their contribution and engagement over the past year. And uh, and I think, you know, one of the things that I pledged when I became your chair was that I would want to make sure that we bring collaboration and we look at how we're moving forward. Uh, we last year passed a bipartisan budget totaling uh, $1.8 billion. We also delivered on our transnet commitments and moved forward uh, critical projects like the I-5 uh, HOV lane 67, 52, and 15 and the 78 HOV connectors, the Purple Line and Blue Line Express projects, the Airport Transit Connection, the Los Santa Relightment, and the Otay Mesa East Port of Entry as we're moving forward. We extended the youth opportunity programs uh, for uh, two more years, and we also brought hundreds of millions of dollars to the San Diego region uh, to help build major infrastructure projects and housing bridge the digital divide and advanced climate action plan, which is why during our executive committee, I made a point of asking that we make sure that we identify how much uh, came to each of the cities, because I think it's important, as well as the unincorporated areas that we're able to highlight that. Um, in addition to all of these uh, accomplishments, we were able to achieve the use of, we didn't have to use the way to vote. You asked me for us not to use it, and we didn't. I think that we had very, very, um, you know, robust conversations in that process, and so I uh, want to make sure that we continue on, and, you know, we're going to agree to disagree, and then we're going to agree on a lot of different things. But in the end, it's the importance of making sure that we are moving the agency forward on behalf of all of our constituents. And so we wanted more collaboration, more deliberation and dialogue, and that's what we did. And that's what we're going to commit to doing this year as well. Um, proud that we were able to accomplish so much. I'm going to turn it over uh, to the team so that they can share some of the highlights. And, um, and uh, I think we should all be very proud of the work that we've done thus far. And 
really taking deeper dives into issues that are been coming along uh, where we really need to address them and address them quickly. So go ahead, uh, Colleen. Hey, thank you, Chairwoman, and Happy New Year, everyone. Um, I'm really delighted to serve in the role as your interim CEO. And I'm extremely proud of the work that this um, agency has accomplished over the last year. Um, this year ahead is gonna be a very important transition as we prepare for the next CEO. And I want you to know that I'm absolutely committed to making sure that we are very focused and we're executing on what the board has asked us to execute on. And that goes from what was approved in the 2024 budget to your budget amendment and things that come out of all of your meetings. I wanna also make sure that we are aligned in such a way that as things come up, we're able to pivot and address those issues and bring them forward to you. I'm committed to providing you with regular updates on what's going on and doing that in a very timely manner. Um, there's a lot that's been going on um, even in the last month uh, since just at the end of the calendar year to get to today. I'm working very closely with all of the directors in the organization to make sure we really are right sizing our work plan to the resources that we have in place today and still allowing us the flexibility to pivot when needed, just like we're doing with the item that's later on the agenda with the update on the 125 toll road, to be able to put people in place, use the best skills that the staff has in order to address issues and to answer the questions that you all are raising. So right-sizing work efforts, really being present, being present in Washington, D.C., as the chairwoman said, so we make sure that we are getting every possible dollar to this region to continue to implement your work plan. Same thing in Sacramento and equally here in the San Diego community in all of your jurisdictions. Communicating and collaborating. So again, open communication. I think all of you know that any of you can call me anytime and I'm here to answer questions and provide information to you. Um, one of the things that I hope you'll have patience with us all on is that we are always making decisions based on the best information we have at the time. It's easy to look back, at, you know, 2020, look back, think, gosh, I wish I had done this or that. But that is the integrity that I come to the table with, and I can assure you the rest of the executive team feels the same way. Um, I also really enjoyed meeting with many of you in advance of the budget amendment that we brought forward this fall. And I wanna do that again in the in the coming year. And I talked with Deputy Mayor Kime um, yesterday about how much I appreciated going out to Oceanside, meeting with the city manager, his planning director, other staff members. And then we actually did a walking tour in Oceanside and I got to see the, the um, surf museum that is in downtown Oceanside in areas that have been completely revitalized just over the last 10 years. And I would love to do that in each of your communities. Know what your jewels are, your favorite places are to walk, the important places in your community. So um, with that, I just want to share with you a brief video that really does a year in review, a look back at what this agency accomplished with your help over the last 12 months. So I'll turn it over to the team to show the video. At Sandac, we're working hard to bring solutions to the San Diego region's biggest challenges, like transportation, social equity, housing, and climate change, all by using data and the latest technology. In 2023, we hit the ground running and made remarkable progress by collaborating with our partners, and it's all thanks to you. We continue to bring home hundreds of millions in grant funding for important projects like the Old Time Mesa East Port of Entry, Low San Rail Corridor, and Safer Street. As we gear up for the next regional plan, we're already making investments in exciting projects all across the region, like the connectors on SR78, SR94, and SR125. And we're also making improvements to the SR67 and SR52. We know there is major need to connect our most dense communities from the border to Sereno Valley with the Blue Line, Purple Line, and an airport transit connection. We started construction on the border to Bayshore Bikeway to connect San Isidro to Imperial Beach, a project that came to life thanks to community input. 
Sandag and Caltrans worked hand in hand to speed up your travels by adding four new carpool lanes on I-5 from Carlsbad to Oceanside. And we teamed up with our local cities to electrify short trips around Oceanside and Pacific Beach with GoSide and the Beach Bug. I do believe that this is an investment in our youth and in the future of our community. We heard you, and we extended the Youth Opportunity Pass for two more years to provide free transit for anyone 18 and under. We also celebrated the 35th anniversary of Transnet, our local half-cent sales tax that funds transportation projects in your community. And the best part? Every year, we bring that money back to each city and the county to help with street improvements while boosting specialized transportation and other programs. The San Diego region thrives when we work together. So, from all of us at Sandag, thank you. So thank you for our Sandag team who put that together. Um, before I go on, I just want to acknowledge that um, I think most of you know how proud I am of our executive team here at Sandag and the amazing leaders we have. And one of them is actually leaving us today, sadly, and that's Sharon Humphreys, who's been the head of engineering and construction for Sandag for the last several years. She truly spearheaded the work on the mid-coast trolley extension, so from Old Town up to UCSD. She's been um, recognized by the Women's Transportation Seminar as the Woman of the Year, with no doubt in my mind exactly why. And what I always like to say about Sharon is you put a brick wall in front of Sharon and all that she leaves behind is the shape of Sharon. So we are extremely proud of everything she's accomplished and everything she's done with her team um, and we'll miss her. We are working right now and plan to have an acting person in her role um, appointed, hopefully before the end of the day. And then we are going to be doing a national recruitment to um, replace Sharon. But I really wanna wish Sharon well and thank her for all of her efforts at Sandeg. She's really a role model for many and appreciate all you've contributed. Thank you, Sharon. Okay, and just to wrap up, um, looking forward, it really is about continuing your work plan, focusing and executing on the future. We have many, many, many projects ahead. We look forward to bringing the FY25 budget to you, which will articulate the specific projects. And at your next meeting, we will be talking about the 2025 regional plan and really what that network looks like. We want you all to weigh in on that, it's a really important part of what this agency does. So with that, thank you, Chairwoman. Um, this concludes my report. Thank you, I'm gonna turn it over to public comment. I have two in-person public commenters on this item. Mark, please come to the podium. You'll be followed by Truth and the final two commenters, the original draw and Paul the Bolt. Mark, wow, <clears throat> before you guys had that poppy little song that's so cheerful, I actually was a little disturbed that you were spending our tax dollars on uh, on uh, toll lanes that we thought we were having built for us, the public, and now you're going to charge us for roads that we built for ourselves. But now that you played the poppy little song, I feel much better. And... Uh, well, I've got 35 seconds left in your authoritarian corporate oligarchy. Pretty much uh, couldn't say much of anything very meaningful in that amount of time. You're doing so many totalitarian things, but you should consider where your grandchildren and your kids are gonna wind up when they're in a society where they cannot travel independently freely. And if they don't have good rifles, and I won't even use the term assault, assault gun or assault rifle, uh, they'll just be in a place like China where they can't do anything no matter what the government does. Consider that, please. Your time has expired. Our next commenter, Truth, please come to the podium. And for the record, I would like to state that all jurisdictions are now present. That's great, hello. Again, look, I'm all smiles. I'm just so happy because we have open communication, not so much for that. 
And that video made it sound like Sandag's going to save the world with our taxes. Thank you. And we heard you. And then it shows Nora. <laughs> wow, that's, man, that's ironic, isn't it? Uh, I'm almost offended, actually. Um, and then we're talking about right-sized work plan. How about right-sizing the use of the budget? I've yet to see that. Uh, let's see. And then Nora said, you know, we didn't have to use the weighted vote. What does that mean? Is, is that a threat to certain board members here? I don't think they appreciate that. And we heard digital divide, the made-up term to justify building the infrastructure for Sandex smart surveillance cities. Definitely against that. And Sharon, I'm going to call you out. You're the one who had a convo with Alan about buses on the shoulder. And guess what? It made the hot mic. Everybody heard it. Congratulations. And uh, that one-day board member retreat at Southwestern College, is that a coincidence? That that's where that's Nora's former employer, you think? Not. Your time expired. Our next commenter, the original draw, please go ahead. Quite interesting to have you give the um, year in review. That's why I think it's important for the people to also give a review because you act like you're giving us more options that you're, you know, fixing the streets and, you know, speeding um, up travel and all this stuff. But when you look around and when you pay attention to all the meetings that you guys have and see what is actually happening, is you're getting people out of their cars. And I don't quite think everybody understands that. Most people don't really know what you guys are doing. And you act like the people are happy with, you know, you spending their money, basically putting us into an enslavement, making it sure that we can't drive, that you have to walk or bike or take some kind of public transit that you're going to offer in our 15 minute city. It's very sad because it's like you guys want to tout like you're doing all these great things, but in reality, you're doing land grabs. You are, you know, putting people like we're doing business with Mexico. Oh, well, there's an invasion at the border. People need to wait. Time expired. Our final commenter on this item, Paul the Bold, please go ahead. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Um, I just wanted to welcome Clean again. Um, it sounds like she will be a much more open person than the previous um, corrupt CEO. Uh, I just want to say that I hope she will moderate between both sides of the issue um, on uh, civility at these meetings. Um, I have heard, I have been at the meetings and heard and seen very bad things coming from both sides. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I just hope that Clean will make it a priority. Your time expired. And that concludes the public comments on this item. Thank you. Any member comments? Seeing none, and then just for the record, so that it's very clear, um, the only time I ever worked for Southwestern College was in 1988 or nine, and it was work study. So I was getting paid probably about minimum wage, in case anybody wanted to know that. So I want to put that on the record. And I did serve on the governing board since 2013 to 2020. So there is no conflict of interest in case anybody was wondering. All right, the next item on the agenda is item number two. Uh, I'd like to emphasize our commitment to accountability and transparency. It's very important for us to have um, this conversation today surrounding our tolling operations. First and foremost, uh, I'd like to emphasize uh, that we are focused on addressing and resolving uh, the accounting customer um, issues. Uh, the Santa Customer Service Center has increased staff and resources to make sure every customer is able to talk to someone if they have any questions or concerns. And so we're making sure that that continues to happen. So please keep us posted if you hear any differently from uh, your constituents. Um, I want to make sure that we also uh, share with all of you that Ray Major uh, has now taken on over the management of the toll operations. We've made the decision uh, in partnership uh, with Colleen last, last um, month. And uh, he's gonna be overseeing the transition to the new uh, back office system. I think it's really important to emphasize this piece because Ray actually comes with over two decades of public 
private industry experience building and implemented software uh, systems. And so he's gonna be able to provide that critical operation expertise needing needed to lead uh, this work moving forward. And so I'm gonna ask Ray to share some of that when when he uh, when we turn it over to him. And then um, this is a top priority. And so I've asked Colleen to make sure that this is something that we are getting uh, that is off top of mind, to, not only to her, but all of us, and that there is um, an action plan that is presented to us uh, as a board so that we can move forward. And so there should be no question that this is uh, something that we take very seriously, that we're doing everything that we can, uh, and that um, we're gonna continue to build the trust uh, of our constituents, and also to make sure that the agency ensures that the systems that are, that we, the systems that we are, have in place are, uh, are such that are uh, moving forward uh, to be able to address them. So I'm gonna turn it over to Colleen, and then we'll turn it over to the team for a presentation. Thank you, Chairwoman. And just to kick this off, when I did my interview with you all, you may recall the priorities that I laid out that I thought needed to be addressed to ensure the success of the next CEO. And that was in, in November. And one of the things I had identified is the importance of making sure that the software and hardware system on our toll roads are operating properly and to fix the things that aren't working properly. I took the direction from you all seriously at your December meeting about the need to assemble a team and for us to really focus and make sure we are addressing the issues. We've done that. And as the chairwoman said, we are very fortunate to have Ray Major on our staff who actually comes with 20 years of experience in the software industry, heading up software companies. And we brought Ray in to head up this effort Lucinda Bouchard, who is a nationally known tolling expert. She's very humble. She won't even smile when I say that, but it is true. And we're very fortunate to have her. And we also brought other team members throughout the agency in order to answer the many questions that you had. And I'm hoping that you'll indulge us. The presentation that Ray has is just about 30 minutes. And the goal here is to address the many questions that have come up prior to the December board meeting, the letter from Mayor Wells, the additional questions that were asked at your board meeting in December. And we want to have present that information to you all. Today, we have an action plan. The team worked diligently over the holidays to put in place an action plan. That's what you asked for, was bring forward an action plan about how we are going to address that. So we're gonna answer the questions, we're gonna lay out the action plan, and then turn it all over to you for your discussion. So with that, I turn it over to Ray Major. Thank you. <clears throat> I, I suppose I'll tell you then a, a little bit about my background. I, I started out of college, I worked here at Sandag for about six or seven years um, as an economist and doing economic research and, and the demographic research. From there, I went into private industry where I worked for companies like Equifax and Nielsen, um, building and designing software systems that did basically uh, demographic analysis for site selection and things like that. So using the type of data that we use here at Sandag, but really did building the software systems. Um, after that, I moved to a startup company which, uh, which did business intelligence software solutions, and I was the CEO and worked with a lot of Fortune 500 companies implementing software solutions. And so my background really is very heavily in technology and um, and software. I came back to Sandag as a chief economist. And um, if some of you remember the forecast error, I think that was my doing. I found that. And um, after that, we corrected that. We came up with an action plan um, to change the way that we do our processes in here to make sure that that will never happen again. And um, then I started to work with all the data groups over here. So. Um, I do have the uh, the background, let's say, to, to be able to address this particular issue that we have at Toll Ops, and, and I'm committed to doing so. Um, as Colleen said, what we are here to do today is to really ask for your support to issue a sole source contract to replace the tolling system technology uh, that we have currently in place rather than going out for an RFP. And it's because of the urgency of doing this. And so I'm going to discuss a little bit about that. This presentation kind of covers three broad topics. One, I'd like to clarify a lot of the um, 
the statements that were made um, last week, uh, or sorry, last month at the December 8th meeting, um, put together some timelines to show you exactly what was happening, answer a lot of the questions that, for instance, Mayor Wells had, had asked that, that weren't answered during the, the meeting on the 8th that you had asked to have answered, and then help everyone understand the definition of who all these companies are and all this stuff that we are doing, because there's so many names and acronyms that we put out there that it, that it almost makes it very difficult, I think, to, to understand what's happening. Um, the second thing that I'm going to try to accomplish in this presentation is to point out the importance of doing this and the urgency and also some of the technology that we would be bringing in. But most importantly, what I'd like to do is to provide you with a plan of how we are going to take care of the customers, make sure that that everybody who um, has a, an account with us is, is, is taking care of that their accounts are, are balanced and in order, and to formulate a plan going forward to make sure that this never happens uh, in the future again. So the information that I'm going to be presenting to you today is everything that I know as of January 12th, 2024. There are a lot of people looking into the toll operations right now, experts from outside this region. And so part of what um, is going to happen over the next couple of months is more and more information is going to, to, to come out. We're going to take that information, we're gonna incorporate it in the plan as, as we, we develop our, our plan to, to fix this going forward. Um, there's a couple of things that I would, I'd like to talk about. I'm going to define what these companies do or these uh, different groups do later on in the slideshow. But you may have heard us mention Fagan. Fagan is a company that we have hired to take a look at the uh, records that did not, um, we were unable to reconcile them in the original uh, financial records. There were about 8,800 of those uh, accounts. Early uh, indications are that they are making progress on that. And so um, I'm, I'm hopeful that they're able to help us uh, understand why those records uh, didn't occur uh, or, or didn't reconcile. The important thing here, and I'm gonna skip down to Davis Farr, is that um, we need to have our financial statements finished by, by March 31st. And everybody is acutely aware who's working on these financial audits that that is a very important date and that we can't miss it. So we have commitments from Fagan to finish their reconciliation uh, by the end of February so that they can give that information to Davis Farr so that they can use that uh, in, 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 their, um, in their financial audit. And we also have OIPA, the, our Office of Independent Performance Auditor, who's also looking into the accounting and financial part of this audit. So at the January 5th meeting, um, the OIPA uh, stated that the things that they were going to be looking into as part of their investigation is the accounting of the 125 toll operations. And then they were also going to try to understand the customer accounting errors and whether the customer errors have been addressed and the contracting relationships associated with the implementation of the 125 tolling system. So there's, there's four parts to what they're looking into. Uh, be, because the financials are so critical, um, I've worked with uh, with Courtney Ruby to um, to come up with a plan where, where where she would be able to give us any of the information on the accounting side by February or before March 31st, so that if there is any issue, Davis Farr can look at that, and then she would continue with the investigation of the rest of the items after um, she finished the first part. We also, in terms of the system audits, have a company called Deloitte, which is a consulting company that we brought in to take a look at the data integrity of the databases that are in the tolling system. And um, they completed their study. They've been working for a couple of months on that. And the, the end result of that is that there are many areas within the data that we cannot take over to a new system. So the data integrity is low in certain areas. And so we're going to have uh, a lot of work to do to move that over to a new system. And that is something that, that we're acutely aware of and we'll be working um, on a plan to make that happen. Sandag toll operations, we now have an improvement plan that I'm going to be putting in place. And that is going to be a continuous improvement plan. It's going to go on for the entire time that we're working 
on implementing the system. There are a couple of dates uh, sometime in March where we should have a detailed written plan for you, something that is similar to the seven point plan that we put together when we had the forecast error. And then um, and we can give you an update sometime in May. Those dates are fungible. I'm going to come to the board to ask you how frequently you want updates on this particular project and we'll be absolutely willing to give them. I'd like to start by uh, just giving some brief definitions so that, that we're all on the same page and we understand um, the, the issues at hand. Um, we operate two different type of facilities. We uh, operate some high occupancy toll lanes, which are the express lanes on I-15. And Mayor Jones, to answer your question from above, there's an $8 maximum on, these, on, these, on this toll road and it is dynamically priced. And that means that the more the traffic that's on that, uh, on, on the toll roads, the more the, the price is. And so if you're seeing $8 more often now, it's because it's dynamically priced and there's more traffic on that particular road. It was relatively cheap to drive this during COVID. Um, in terms of the SR-125 toll road, that's a 10 mile stretch of a tolled facility. And there we collect money from everybody who drives it. And the fees on that are between 50 cents and $3.50 if you're paying cash and 50 cents and $2.75 um, if you have a fast track account. The difference between an HOV and a toll road is that with an HOV, as you see in the top picture, those are the carpool lanes. And that means that somebody who is in a carpool can, can drive those lanes without paying. Uh, the only time you have to pay for those lanes is if you are a single occupant vehicle and you want to use those lanes, then you have a transponder and then we would charge you for using that. Um, it, as far as the SR-125 goes, every vehicle pays and they pay by different types, different ways. So either a fast track account, which is a transponder, you can pay by plate, credit card, cash. So, so different options there. Councilmember Musgrove had asked some questions at the last um, meeting, which talked about the I-15 and whether or not um, we were able to determine how many people were driving on those lanes who weren't necessarily paying for it. So luckily I have access to the data science team and I was able to, to come up with, with some numbers here with our uh, transportation modeling. These are ballpark numbers, but pretty much um, these are the numbers that, that kind of describe the difference between the I-15 and the I and the 125. In terms of, of trips, um, Councilmember Musgrove was correct. The I-15 carries more traffic than the SR-125. So it's about a 60-40 split with 60% of, of, of the traffic or the 45 million trips are on the express lanes. When you look at the bar charts, what that shows is uh, the, the number of people or how we're collecting or, or the type of people are going through the, the facility. There are about 7 million people who use or, uh, trips that are fast track trips. So those are people who are paying for it through with a transponder. About 13 million trips are, are HOV trips or high occupancy vehicle trips, the carpool trips. And if we do the calculations and, and you look at this from uh, back of the napkin, uh, there are about 7.5 million trips that are, are single occupancy vehicles that are not paying, okay? The way that we calculated that is that we have a study from 2019 that there is about 25 to 30% of the traffic in the high occupancy vehicle lanes is, is not being paid for. So those, so I think um, Council Member Musgrove used the word, we were giving, giving that away. Um, that would amount to ballpark, back a napkin, about $12 million per year that we would be losing from that facility. I do want to point out that that is not unique to, uh, to Sandag or to San Diego. This is something that happens statewide. We're working with our partners at Caltrans, um, and we will be bringing an item to you at some point later in terms of what, what we can do, um, do about that. But this hopefully answers those questions that, that, that came out. In terms of the toll revenue, the toll revenue is almost a, an 80-20 split with the SR-125 bringing in about 80% um, or 78% um, 
of the $50 million in tolls. So 11.1 million is coming from the SR15, uh, and that's coming from Fast Track. The rest of it comes from the SR125. And as you can see, uh, Fast Track is the largest way we collect money. And then we have uh, cash and credit. So when you, when, when you go through, use your credit card, et cetera. And then um, we also have uh, violations on those toll roads. Um, in the SR15, or sorry, the I-15, there is less than half a percent of a category that is that is fines and forfeitures, and so there are some fines we collect there, but it's too small of a of a a number to show uh, broken out on this particular graph. So before I get started. And talking about the, the back end system, what I'd really like to explain is some of these roles and responsibilities that um, we have within the agency and all these different companies that we're using. Thank you. Um, so Sandag, in terms of the 125, Sandag is the owner of the the, the 125. We we own we we own and operate the, the the toll operations center. We do customer service from down there. We do all the facilities maintenance, the things like landscaping. We reconcile toll re, uh, revenue through our finance department. We manage the debt portfolio, so that's the money that we've borrowed to purchase this. That, that Andre does that um, in the finance department. Um, we manage the contracts. In terms of, of the system, what we really do is we have an, we seem to have an administrative project management role where we we are the owner of this uh, toll operation. But in terms of the software, what we do is, is we set up a lot of meetings, we, we, we pay invoices and, and those type of things. Um, HNTB has been brought up a, a couple of times and HNTB is a tolling system advisory service. They they do engineering contacts. This is a this is a hundred year old firm and we do a lot of work for them. And so uh Deputy Mayor Kime, you had asked a couple of times what they do and what they did for the for the for the money that, that they had gotten for, for this particular operation. Um, but before I do that, I'd like to just read to you what the definition is of HNTV in the contract that we have with them. And they are an, they are an on-call consultant to Sandag to provide implementation support services for the back office project, including additional oversight tasks for installation, training, testing, transition, go live, and post go live support services. So that is why we hired them for this particular job. Mayor Wells, you had asked uh, several questions about the number of contracts we have with HNTB, the amount of money, et cetera. Um, we have 17 contracts that are open right now uh, with HNTB with a total value of a, a awarded value of $33 million. This is one of those contracts. And this one is to manage um, the, the, SR, the implementation of this back office system. The HNTB manages two different companies for us in terms of implementing this system. So our, our tolling operation consists of, of two different pieces. There's a roadside system. So those gantries that you drive through with the cameras, that is called the roadside. And that is implemented by a company called CaptureTraffic.com. When we talk about ETAN and we talk about the work that they do, that is the software system on the back end that supports it. So all the data is collected on the roadside and then there's a just imagine a pipe that goes to the to the back office system and it's all processed on the back office. So there, 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 there are two different systems that we're working with over here. Um, in terms of, of CAPTCH, their contract was to furnish and install a roadway system for tolling and related operations and to provide associated maintenance and software support services for the roadway system. So um, HNTB managed them and is, is continuing to manage them uh, on both the I-15 and the, the 125. The last company that's involved in this is ETN. ETN is this back, uh, back office system in integrator and their contract calls for them to furnish and install regional back office systems for tolling and related operations and to provide associated maintenance and software support for the back office system. So they are actually, so, uh, they, they do the software development and they also do um, the implementation and they maintain a cl the cloud-based system that we use with them right now. 
All the transaction processing goes through there. They have all of the, the, the telephone systems, the customer support equipment, the 511 uh, fast track website, all the data warehousing, it's all, it all belongs to them. Um, they also do the project management and resource management of the software development of, of this specific software system along with the bug fix, fixes. So they are the developer of this. Um, HNTV manages that particular contract too. So that's that. those are the responsibilities um, that, that we have over here. When you heard about the $1.8 million being lost uh, in revenue when, the, when our, our toll system went down, that was actually this, the, the, the previous system that CAPT replaced that was going down because it was aging and we hadn't been able to replace it yet with the CAPT system. And so what ended up happening is we ended up losing tolling revenue, but that was from the old system. Other entities that are involved in, in this, um, this, this entire this in discussion includes OIPA, which was created by AB805. And right now, as I talked about, they're doing the investigation of, of what's happening um, on, on the 125. And we're working closely with OIPA to make sure that they have any information that they need in order to do the analysis that they need. There's also a company that we, we, we have contracted with called Fagan. So you'll see this name now coming out. Fagan is an independent tolling expert, and they're working with us right now, as I talked about a little bit earlier, to, uh, to determine what happened to the 8,800 uh, records that we, we weren't able to, to um, put in the, in the journal. But in addition to that, we're looking forward to using them as our subject matter expert going forward uh, with the new implementation. There's a company that you may have heard of called out, which was Davis Farr. Davis Farr is our external financial auditor. Um, and these, we had, prior to them, we had Crow LLP. This is the first year that they've been, they, they're doing this for us. They did it five years ago. They're now um, um, doing it for us again. Davis Farr was selected by our audit committee and they were interviewed and, and, and selected. And so they are an independent external financial auditor that we're working with and, um, uh, Jennifer Farr was here on, on December 8th um, when we did that presentation. And then finally, Deloitte and A to B. Deloitte and A to B are the companies that we are looking forward to, to, to move to. We're looking to move to their technology, uh, their, which is essentially going to be uh, replacing the ETAN technology. Uh, I know that A to B isn't familiar with for a lot of people, but they have four and a half million customers right now, and they process 600 million transactions with their tolling system today. And we have, just as a comparison, we have about 90,000 customers uh, uh, right now. So we're very small compared to what they're doing already. Okay, this is, this is what a tolling system looks like. This is what we're trying to replace. And I want to show you this to, to try to um, have you understand how complex this back office system is and the fact that you can't just um, unplug it and plug something else in and that it, it does take time to do it. These docu this document here, not just this one, but this pile over here, these are the specifications for the ETAN system that we were implementing. Okay, so as you can see, it's, it, there, there's a tremendous amount that needs to be built in order to make a system like this work. And I don't wanna go through every one of these bubbles, but I do want to point out the three that are in purple, which talk about where the problems really lie. The reconciliation and reporting is what Andre talked about last, uh, last month, where we're unable to reconcile our general ledger. The customer support center, has issues in it, which makes it difficult for us to be able to manage our customer accounts and give them refunds, et cetera. And so we, we have to replace that. And then there's the DMV regis, uh, registered um, lookups, which makes, again, causes us problems. We don't have a good connection there, which means that if you buy a new automobile and we need to add that to your account, these are very difficult things to do right now. Um, so these, so there are problems with all the components, but those are the three biggest reasons, uh, you know, things that we need to fix immediately. The current system as it sits has about 1800 bugs in it. So we call them open tickets, okay? And we're working through these with the vendor. About 58% of those bugs are on the business operations side. 
So those are things that usually customers don't necessarily see. Those are things that we end up having to triage as a team down at the toll operations center. About 25% of the bugs are related to customer uh, uh, related things, not necessarily uh, that the accounts are wrong, but for instance, the running balance and an account balance are, are inconsistent when a customer might look at it. So these are things that are customer facing bugs that we need to fix. And then about 17% of the bugs relate to the finance and accounting portion of the system, okay? What you see in the gray area are system functionalities that have not been developed yet. Our estimate is that that's, that, that's probably about a half of the system that we contracted for. And so these are things that, that we need. So the base system is up there. We're, we're constantly working on, on uh, working through these bugs, but the system doesn't necessarily get better as it ages. We find more things wrong with it. And that's part of the reason that it, it is really urgent for us right now to um, immediately move away from this system towards one that is much more stable. This is a timeline of events, and I'd like to go through this just a little bit because there are a lot of questions here that were asked by board members and also um, in Mayor Wells' letter uh, that relate to when we knew things, et cetera. Um, Mayor Krantz, you had asked how far back did the problems go? I don't know if you were specifically uh, talking about finance problems or problems with the system, but I'm gonna answer all of that. And then uh, Councilmember Musgrove uh, wanted to know when we knew about certain things. Um, in this particular slide, what you see is a timeline that starts um, on, at December 16th. That is when the board adopted the contract with ETAN. But this goes back further than that. So when we purchased the toll road, we already knew that there was a aging system in there that needed to be replaced. And um, we worked with HNTB at the time to help us determine um, who should replace this system. So the information that I found was that we worked at HNTB has worked closely with Sandag on the tolling system project since 2012, gathering user needs, creating system and performance specifications, and in stewarding two procurements through our contracts and legal groups. Now, this dates back before me, this particular document that I'm reading from. But what I think it refers to is that they helped us uh, as our subject matter experts to under to figure out what type of tolling system we needed, write the specifications with us. And then um, we selected uh, as an agency, ETAN and CAPTCH to do this work. Um, we awarded the contract to ETAN in 2017, and it was supposed to go live in October of 2018. And that is when our liquidated damages began. Um, the system for the I-15 actually started to be used in November of 2020, and then we started using the system for SR-125 in May of 2022. So that kind of gives you some high level of when, when this happened. Um, we have been collecting liquidated damages. So moving down to the red line with ETAN, since October of, of 2018, Mayor Wells, you had asked about liquidated damages. It now is 1,844 days. It amounts to $6.45 million. We continue to collect those liquidated damages. We've sent them uh, two letters um, of notices to cure, one in 2019 and the other one in 2023. So we are, we're actively on, on top of um, these liquidated damages. I did wanna point out also the, the CAP system. And the reason I'm bringing this forward is that uh, Mayor Krantz, you had talked about the fact that we didn't bring things to you when we had when we knew about it. Um, I wanted to make it clear that there's also liquidated damages on the roadside system that amount to 1,573 days and $3.34 million in liquidated damages there. The big difference here is that um, that we are working really closely with CAPS. The CAPS system is up and running. They're fine tuning it right now. And we're working with them. Lucinda and I met with the CEO of um, CAPS between Christmas and, and, and New Year's. And, and this is something that we'll be able to work out. And so we're not really worried about this from an implementation perspective, but here too, we've sent them uh, several letters to, to, to cure. So that's that's kind of the timeline of, of what has happened. And in terms of the reporting, and I think this is important too, these it, there is no such thing, or it's, it's very difficult to trace back when we actually knew that the system wasn't going to be able to do the financial, uh, the, the GL balance. 
what we did know, if you trace this back and going through thousands of bugs, is that in April of 2020, we saw that there were some data reporting issues, okay? Um, and we had, we had filed those to be fixed with ETAN. By November of 2020, because that's when the I-15 came live, we started noticing that there were reporting issues and we were identifying those and we were, we were sending those to ETAN as bugs that needed to be fixed. Um, in December of 2022, ETAN and Sandag prioritized that these bugs needed to get fixed, that the reporting bugs were, were, were the most important bugs that needed to get fixed and they committed to putting additional resources on it. When we fast forward to 20 to September of 23, when we're using these reports, which is and one of them is this general ledger report that, that we were having problems with, um, we came to an understanding with ETAN that we were never going to be able to fix not only that report, they were not going to be able to fix that report, and we were not going to be able to get the type of data that we needed out of the system. And that is the the, the moment that we finally said, okay, we absolutely need to move off of this system. We've been doing research ahead of that in, in preparation of something like this happening, but that's the September date that, that we've been putting out there. More importantly, uh, it's, it's really uh, is what is it that we're, we're, we're doing going forward? This is an extra slide that is not in the deck. I put this in because there are a lot of questions about who is this A to B and it's a foreign company and, and have they ever done anything in the US? And the truth of the matter is that they do have a, a US presence. And you see any of those uh, states that are in purple or in the hash lines, they have some tolling operations um, or, or some type of presence in those states. The green ones are the ones where Deloitte does work. So both of these companies are, 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 are very much familiar working in the US and they would just be adding um, their work to, to ours. What is it that we would be replacing? So I talked a little bit about this back office system. This is what we would be replacing. It's all the stuff that we had um, in the back office system. Um, Deloitte would be working with A to B to make that happen. But the new system, the old system was specified almost a decade ago. And there's been so much changes in terms of technology that there's a lot of additional features in this one that would come with it. One, for instance, is interna international payment processing. And this is something that we absolutely need if we're going to be able to implement Otay Mesa East and, and toll that facility. And so this already has that functionality in it. This system also has an ERP integration, which is our new financial backend. And what we want to do is to be able to, to hook to that. Almost 30 minutes. Okay. Good job. That's so it also has mobile applications. It has all sorts of other things in it that we're going to be able to use. In terms of the, the, the feature functionality that's going in there, the timeline right now is about 11 months to be able to implement this. That includes moving the data over. That would give us the core system that we needed. Uh, there's additional functionality that we'd be rolling out next year as we determine what is the most important to roll out. In terms of the cost, and this is something that uh, Mayor Kam, you had asked about our, uh, several times, our total expenditure to date on the existing system to HNTB is 4.3 million, ETN is 8.4 million, and Fagan is about $200,000 for a total cost of about $12.9 million to date. There would be about an additional $2.3 million in expenditures for us to continue to work with these vendors to keep this system up and running for the next year as we transition. And then we have, uh, we have about $28.7 million cost associated with the new system of which 11 million is the back office system and the rest of it is for maintenance and support through 2030, okay? Um, the action plan, which is really the most important part of this, uh, talks about what we are going to be doing going forward. There is a, an attachment that we sent out to you that talked about in the short term what we were doing and what we were progressing going forward. And the areas of focus that I wanted to talk about really is that we are going to be adopting a SANDAG as an owner philosophy. And so we're going to have increased vendor management. 
We're going to increase focus on customer support. We've already added 10 people down there to help with customer problems. We're gonna replace the backend system. We're going to develop and formalize an escalation uh, plan so that uh, issues can come to management and eventually to the board of directors so we know what information uh, you're interested in knowing. We will, we will um, be able to escalate that. We're going to um, implement the, the system through a formalized project management office. We're going to assess organizational structure and figure out what kind of staffing needs we need over there. And we're going to implement operational improvements, institute continuous improvement programs, just like we did with our forecasting process. And then very importantly, we need to update our policies and procedures and create documentation so that um, the, the system is completely transparent. And we're going to add formal QA and um, functions to what we're doing. So an independent QA looking at that. And then we're going to provide regular reports and status updates to uh, anybody who's interested in hearing about them on a regular basis. And with that, Chair, I apologize for the time and I hand it back to you for questions. So just to wrap up, um, you did stay within time, Ray. So thank you. You promised 30 minutes and that's exactly what you yeah, did. No. I wanna, <laughs> I wanna, um, Thank the chairwoman for your leadership and allocating the time that was needed to really go through these details. And thank you to all of you, because this is very detailed information. And I think you probably have seen now what the team has been putting together over the last four weeks. So again, thank you for the leadership. I'll turn it back over to you. You're welcome. We're gonna go ahead and open it up for public comment and then we'll have a member comment. Thank you, chairwoman. I have seven public commenters on this item. The first is Consuelo, who will be followed by Mark, and then Alan. Consuelo, please come to the podium. I think she's up to the... Okay. I will go ahead and go with Mark first. Mark, please come to the podium. Good to know you have an independent auditor as you steal our tax dollars to buy our lanes away from us. At least your theft is legal. Um, and fines may be small for your graph, but they are not for poor drivers. Um, I, as I stated before in the executive committee meeting, it's blatantly obvious that people didn't pay tax dollars to build roads for themselves, to have you guys sell their rights to a subsidiary corporation. Well, not you, You're, you are the subsidiary corporation that got sold to. Uh, people don't know this, they would be really upset if they knew that, and here's your documentation right here saying that your goals are to reduce uh, congestion and reduce vehicle miles traveled and greenhouse gases. Even though right now, of course, we're having one of the greatest coal fronts ever. And John Coleman, who won Meteorologist of the Year, clearly says in his YouTube videos what a scam this is, as well as Fran Drescher's husband with four MIT degrees, et cetera. So, uh, by the way, you have a duty to not enforce these mandates. They're unconstitutional. Your time has expired. Our next commenter, Alan, please come. Oh, Consuelo is here. Consuelo, please come to the podium. Thank you. You'll be followed by Alan and then followed by Truth. So two things Major said, there's a problem with all the components and we absolutely need to move out of the system. Ray, I couldn't agree more. At least we agree on that. Uh, catchtraffic.com, to keep track and control of the tax cattle being charged for what the tax cattle have already paid for. Got it. Profit, profit, profit. Um, so why are we even talking about this? Only single drivers will be charged, right? But according to Senor Shu, driving alone is the most dangerous thing to be doing. So, I mean, come on, Sandeg, you're way off track from the narrative. Alan, please come to the podium. You will be followed by Truth, who will be followed by Paul the Bold. Please take a look at that sign. 125 is on there by transit tax. Anybody here can put it on next week's agenda. Remove the toll now. We were promised that road back in 1987. Let me give you a couple more reasons why I need to remove the toll immediately. It was pointed out 180 million left. You also pointed out back in December that you saved 265 million by not expanding the road. This time you want to spend another 32.5, 32.7 million 
for this crap. All that needs to be PDF to the public. And right now you need to stop this, remove the toll now because you'll save all the people from San, San Ysidro, National City, Chula Vista, everybody who has get clogged up traffic 805 and five. And yes, North County 15 should not have been expressway because it says right there, expand 15, not for fr toll roads that only the rich can afford, but freeway as stated, free for everybody. Do the right thing, put it on the agenda. Anybody here, remove the toll now, I yield back. Truth, please come to the podium. You will be followed by Paul the Bold and the final two commenters, Blair B and the original draw. It's just the ledger, a dirty napkin that was allowed to have all the wrong numbers on it because of broken software for years on end. The system's working just as well as the public transit. While the South Bay suffers and dies with toll roads and incorrect charges that for some suspicious reason, Nora was offended by Bill asking for an independent audit into. Well, I actually had that same request in my speech that offended day, and I cut it out at the last minute. In fact, I played much of that incident in the city of El Cone, and everyone loved it. So be careful what you do here, people. It'll travel. And Jack Shue, I found it funny when your defense of this toll system was its recovery from bankruptcy. If a so-called well-respected agency can't even fix it, maybe it went out of business for a reason. And the new over $31 million toll system from A to B is a company that pushes road user tax charges via satellites and phone data and congestion taxes via ALPRs in smart surveillance cities. And now people have to wait a whole year for a non-broken toll system with a toll rate hike. That's our sandag. Sorry to burst your bubbles full of incompetencies. Thank you. Paul the Bold, please go ahead. You'll be followed by the final two, Blair B and the original draw. Uh, Paul Bold, dynamically priced as a scam, like roulette, comedy time. The report says Sandag brought the SR-125 toll system in 2011, already broken. The timeline omits this. And apparently you did little to fix it until you implemented a new system in 2016 and 17. And now you have the nerve to say over the past few years, there have been ongoing issues. Six years is not a few. The statement alone cries out for an independent investigation and solution. And meanwhile, you spent $9 million on a broken system. Too many contractors. And I have zero confidence in Sandag to fix problems which it keeps minimizing. And has anyone explained why people should actually pay tolls into a broken system? Until it is fixed, no tolls should be charged to anyone. I'm glad. Your time expired. Blair B., please go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you. Uh, because we have had a toll road pass, doesn't mean we have to uh, be locked into a toll road future. Good luck on how we can uh, uh, work on that sort of issue. But with that being said, and that we are working on uh, toll issues with this item, a really good report. Uh, thank you for it. Uh, um, I'm interested how you know the future of AI work that he, this person is very uh, lovingly talks about, uh, has a lot of knowledge about. I, it really can be a right, uh, I mean, a uh, issue, uh, how to better work towards human rights ideas and ideals and good practices. Good luck in finding those steps uh, for the future of our AI. It's really important to do that. And as always, with the uh, tech involved here, accountability and openness and clarity with the public, we don't have to fear those things. Uh, good luck in being open with the public on this subject matter in the future. Thank you. Uh, with tech, with tech things in the future. Thank you. Our final commenter, the original draw, please go ahead. Yeah, remove the toll and then we won't have this issue. You guys, you could just go home. It'd be great. But it's interesting that you're so negligent that you know there's 1,800 bugs, that there's always been a problem with the system that, and you purchased it. And now you're just looking into it really and exposing it because it's been exposed through the press. That was what the concern was. And you're only auditing the I-25. I understand that the back system office is the same, but the way that they are charged is different. And you're, you should be auditing the financials of the 15 as well because there are people 
people who have had problems and you need to recognize all of it. And there's no way in hell anybody should we the people should be spending forty six point nine million dollars just to fix this problem. That's why if you just get rid of the toll and forget about it, there's no system that needs to be fixed. And the people aren't going to be robbed of their money that they work very, very hard for. And OIPA was also saying that they were going to because this was brought forward after someone was fired for bringing this forward. And they're bringing forward a fraud hotline to have employees go in there and saying that there won't be retaliation. Well, there's proof in the pudding. There already has been. Do something about that first. Was there before? Your time expired. That concludes the public comments. All right. So um, I want to make sure I do a time check. It is about, it is 1140. And this is a very uh, important issue for everyone. We have still a lot of work to do in our agenda. So if you could be um, very concise and and succinct in your comments, we would appreciate that. Uh, what ends up happening is at around 12.30, we start losing quorum. And so I wanna make sure that we all are very mindful of that. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Council Member Burkhold. My comments are for just general member comments, Chair. Thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, Mayor Jones, I'm sorry? Concise. Yes. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chair. Um, okay. so. Where do I start? I mean, there is a lot. And as the conversation was was going on, more things came to my mind. So I'm happy that we are finally uh, looking at this and prioritizing uh, transparency. However, we've already spent a lot of money. Um, I just want to read something from the handout, and that is um, our management company, HNTB, their job is to implement and support support services for the back office and the roadway system, then also to test and review. And uh, as as I look at all of this, we actually have in here to pay to continue to pay on a failed system of incompetence, in my opinion, um, almost like well, it's 1.3, so it's about 1.8 million dollars. Back in uh, April of 2022, it came to light that we had about 1.8 million dollars of lost revenue because we had disconnected um, uh, technology. That's a problem. They, someone knew, and we know for a fact we've known since about 2020. And by the way, Ray, this is not directed toward you. This is a very frustrating thing when I think about how we are wasting taxpayer dollars and we're not protecting our citizens, and that's a problem for me. So when, when I look at how much we've already spent to HNTB, for them to not do their job, and we've known this, uh, $4.3 million, and then in the transition, another half a million dollars. That is a real problem for me. And to be honest, I know we have to move forward. There is all the data proves that, but to continue to put more money where we already know we have failed is completely irresponsible, I think, if we do approve it with that um, particular caveat. So um, we've already seen that HNTB um, also has, um, you know, just totally failed. And when we look at what's happening too, on a side note, we have HNTB that has spent, and this is in their campaign finance disclosures, over $400,000 to get a ballot measure to pass to tax all San Diego County residents forever, forever. And and so when we're talking about, okay, we, we've already paid them, we're looking at spending another $500,000 toward a system or a manager that hasn't done their job, and it's literally almost $2 million. And again, this isn't this isn't uh, directed at you, but it, it's a problem. And I know I see our outside independent, our um, Office of the Independent Auditor, Courtney Ruby, here today. I'm glad that she's working on the 125, and then I think the 15 is going to be coming later. But we already have... This this particular uh, vendor has failed. We know they have failed. We've been paying them to fail, which I don't understand that. Honestly, the liquidated damages is only, I think, $4.8 uh, $8 million, and we have spent already $4.3 million on just the management of this par portion. So when I, when I put all of the data together, I'm very frustrated. I, I'm sure we should all be frustrated with this. This is totally incompetent. And for us to spend one more dime on this, I have a real problem with that. So I would make a motion 
to do everything that you want us to do except pay for this middleman um, of uh, $1.8 million. So that would be $1.3 million to ETAN and then $500,000 to HNTV because we know for a fact based on everything that we've been given here today, that they have already failed. So everything else, even though it's going to cost us more money, we do need to turn this around and we do need to fix it. However, I can't justify that representing the taxpayer for all of the county that we spent one penny more on a, on a, on a two companies that have clearly not done anything they were supposed to do since 2018. Now, let's not forget the deliverable, the deliverable time was 2018. So, and we can't claw that money back and we've already spent all this money toward them. But my motion would be to remove the $1.8 million and otherwise move forward. Thank you, Chair. I can't emphasize enough how important this item is to the city of Chula Vista. First of all, I want to express my gratitude to the Sandex staff for their informative presentation regarding the future of our toll systems. The toll portion of the SR-125 is almost entirely within Chula Vista. It has been the long-held position of the city to seek the end of the toll system as soon as the bonds can be paid off. The bonds are callable in 2027, and SANDEC has already received $20 million from the state of California to assist with eliminating the remaining, remaining debt. The agreement uh, before us today is for five years and 11 months, ending in 2029. Given that this board has prioritized uh, debt elimination by 2027, collection of tolls on this road may not be needed through 2029. There is a potential savings in this agreement that could be used for debt reduction. Uh, therefore, I just want to make a question. Is there a stipulation within the agreement that would address this? Uh, also, and additionally, I, as a city, we'd like to request in future meetings an update on the status that the directives adopted by the board in 2022, specifically the status of a plan to repay outstanding debt by 2027 when bonds are callable. Thank you. Andre, did you want to answer that question? So just as a quick background, when we purchased the toll facility in 2011 out of bankruptcy, we had some TIFIA loans that we refinanced. And so you're right, we have outstanding bonds right now. They're originally about $225 million. Today, there's $161 million outstanding. We expect if we continue the collections between now and 2027, which is the first time that we can pay off the bonds, uh, we may have about $130 million in reserves um, that could pay off those bonds in addition, including the 20 million that we just got on the WASO bill. So we'd still be about $14 million short to pay off the entire facility. But the one thing is also, we have the franchise agreement with Caltrans through 2043. We're supposed to maintain the road. In fact, I've talked to my partners here at Caltrans, including Mr. Townsend. When we turn over the facility back to Caltrans in 2027, if we're able to pay off the facility, they may need some of those reserves to maintain the road. So yes, we do have a healthy reserve balance, but some of that may need to go to Caltrans if we were to turn over the facility early. And I, we've already had some conversations with Caltrans on that. I appreciate that information. I, and I look forward to understanding a little better uh, how moving forward this would look like and the amounts and what it would take to keep the maintenance. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> well, um, Mayor Jones did a good job of asking most of the questions I wanted to ask about finances. But I, I have a, a question more about transparency. The the timeline that you showed showed that there were marks all the way from 2016 where we started seeing problems that were arising. And it seems to me there are pretty significant problems. Why was the board just recently told about all these things? Well, with with any of these implementations that we're doing that are operational, and I think you can um, 
you look at the ERP system too that we've implemented over the last two years. A lot of this, these these things are operational. We don't bring um, that information necessarily to the board. I think also during that time period, what we were trying to do, and and again, this is my um, this is my my opinion. I wasn't involved in in anything that had to do with tolling back then, but it seemed to me that what we were doing is trying to work with the vendor at the time to overcome the issues that were there. And so, uh, with the help of of HNTB and, and 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 our staff here, we were we were trying to get that system up and running because there really was a a, a real deadline that needed to be met, and that's one of the reasons we had to cut over is that. Um, there were there were there were certain things that were not going to be able to work anymore. Like we were not going to be able to collect credit cards because we couldn't get certified on the software anymore. So there's a lot of technical reasons we had to move it over. And at that point, I'm assuming that what what, what happened is there was a decision to that it was better to try to continue to work with the vendor than to move forward. I mean, sorry, than to than to replace it at that particular time. All, that all makes sense, but I still, you know, we're we're talking about six point four five million dollars in liquidated damages and the board didn't know about this is certainly came to everybody's attention on the sandex staff before uh, october which is i think when the first time we heard about it it's and the next thing i, I want to ask is when it comes to the loss of the 1.8 million dollars you, you you know what i'm referring to when, yes. when we weren't collecting tolls for that period of time yes how much was um hntb involved on that well, HNTB was our our vendor who was working with the with CAPTCH to replace the roadside system at the time. So there was a, a Transcore was our, our the system that we had implemented. It needed to be replaced. The, the equipment was old. That was right during COVID. I know I don't want to use that as necessarily as an excuse, but there there was a time period there where. CAPTCH didn't have people who they could put on the job. And so they were late at the beginning implementing the roadway system. And it had just to do with the logistics of, of, of how work was being done during that time period. But at the end of the day, HNTB's role it was to manage that particular vendor. The, the, the way that this contract was set up, and this is something that I, I, I was trying to allude to during the um, areas of, of, of focus is that Sandag hired HNTV to really be our owner's representative. That they 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 represented us in these implementations. Although we're the owner, they're the ones who are making those decisions. They're the subject matter experts, and so we allowed them in many cases to um, to manage these projects. I mean, they uh, they were in constant communication with them, so they weren't doing this on their own. But at the end of the day, they're they're. You asked what their role was in it. Their role was managing CAPTCH to put in the roadside system. So there was two contracts there. And the other one was to manage ETAN to put in the back office system. So does somebody owe the taxpayers that money back? Or, or I mean, it seems to me that they, I'm sure they're insured and they're bonded. So they have failed this, this process, obviously. So are they going to reimburse Sandag for the money that they lost? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that question. Are you talking about CAPTCH or, or? I'm talking specifically about the $1.8 million that wasn't collected. John, do you know? S excuse me, I think um, just to interject here, and I think I have this information correct, but somebody correct me. We that, we that was our... changed hardware. So CAPTCH is, is, deals with the hardware out on the roadway. That was a transition. There was a company, what was it? It was Transcore. Transcore. And it's a Transcore so that, that the loss that you're talking about, Mayor, was with that old hardware system that the team was out in the field trying to, you know, <clears throat> piece that together and keep it alive while we moved to the new okay. system. So that was all on the the hardware piece. So if I have that right. So I, I want to. I think that's an important clarification. In, in essence, you're saying it, it's our as an entity. That's our fault that this happened. So yeah, okay, that's fine. Right. Yeah, no, that's perfectly fine. I just want to understand that. Just a couple more questions. I'll, I'll yield. Um, so you said HNTB has seventeen contracts worth thirty three million dollars. Is is that a lot? In, in I mean, are there more? Are there 
organizations that we contract out with that have more contracts for higher dollar amounts, or is that the highest that we have? Kelly, do you have an answer to that? I, I don't know it compared to other vendors. We, we do have many vendors that, that have large amounts of contracts with us uh, to do the type of work that HNTV does. Do, do you know, Kelly? Uh, I'd like to request a list of all, all the high dollar contractors that, that we have. I know that you can't give me every contract you have, let's say over a certain threshold, over $5 million. Um, I'd like to request a, a list of all those and, and to know how much they're getting paid each year. Um, and just to conclude, you know, I, it seems to me that HNTB is probably our biggest contractor. Um, HNTB and ETON both completely failed. And that makes me concerned about the other $33 million in contracts that we have with this company that has not done their job. I'm also very concerned about the fact that it seems to me like there's not been very much transparency to the board from the Sandeg management. Um, it seems to me like many of these issues should have been talked about regularly at board meetings and let the board weigh in on solutions and not just hear about it later and say, you know, we have to pay this now because it's too late. There's nothing else we can do. It doesn't really mean to me, it doesn't make me feel like the board is really doing anything. Why, why are we here? Are, are we supposed to just sign off on whatever the board does or are we actually supposed to be part of the process? So I, I, I would ask that. And because of that, because of all those things and the fact that I am very concerned about what Mayor Jones brought up about HNTB being very involved in putting massive amounts of money into the sales tax initiative. And by the way, sales tax initiatives that are meant to circumvent the normal two thirds threshold and lower it down to 50%, which I do not think the public's going to understand. And we have one of our biggest vendors putting money into that because they're going to get the money from the sales tax. All of this seems very wrong to me. And again, I request an independent outside investigation into this issue that is not associated with Sandag in any way that can come back and give this board a report as to what's happening and, and what changes we have to make to be more transparent to, we, to ourselves and to the public. And I would like a written response to this request, and I request that it be agendized for the next meeting so the board can vote on that. Thank you. Council Member Duncan. So preliminarily, I want to say that I'm very pleased that you're involved with this, Ray, and I do definitely believe that um, you desire to be transparent and give us the information and get to the bottom of it. Um, a, a couple of requests that I'd like to ask you to consider and, and please do. Um, when you provide us information as we go along with the situation, if you know that it is different than information that was provided to us and you know when it was provided to us um, with different numbers at a different time or different facts, if you would tell us that while you're getting, instead of just giving us new numbers or new information, say, board, I want to let you know that this was previously told to you in a different manner in a different fashion or a different number, because to me, that is true transparency to the board and uh, to the public. One comment on the timeline of events, which I believe is slide 13, if you could have it up for one moment, please. Um, and I don't, I 100% do not believe you said this intentionally, or you may have said it and had a different meaning than I took it. But uh, when we are looking at the uh, timeline of, of events in regard to Etown, it shows the continuing amount of liquidated damages at the 6.45 million. And I just want to be clear to the board and also to the public. I, I, I thought the words that you said were, we continue to collect that money. And what I think you meant to say was, we continue to account for the damages because unless I'm wrong, please let me know, we have not collected a dollar, and again, I may be wrong. My understanding was we have not collected a dollar of that actual 6.45 million in damages. And thank you for that 
um, that correction. We didn't collect that. That is, it's, it's accrued, right? So we, we accrue a certain amount of liquidated damages per day. With ETAN, it's $3,500 per day. And so as of January uh, 12th, it's 6.45 million. So no, we, we don't collect that money. It's it, it's not cash, right? And, and again, I think that's what you meant to convey. Yes. And I, I 100% you know believe you're being candid with us, and I really appreciate it. I just want to make sure that everybody understood that because um, I think it's a very important point. Um, I appreciate all the other questions um, the colleagues on the board have raised today. Um, I don't know if right now is the appropriate time, but uh, do you have a response to Mayor Jones' comments about the effect that? I mean, her motion, which is still pending for a second, I guess, that um, potentially Eton or HNTB removed from that part of the future contract. Mm -hmm. I know we had some discussion about uh, potentially about Eton in regard to that. And do you have anything you would like to, to share with us? It's It would be extremely complicated, if not impossible, to not continue to pay them. And the reason is that this is a cloud-based application that ETN is is hosting, and a lot of those monies would be to make sure that that system stays up and running so that we can use it, along with any major bugs that we might find that we need them to immediately fix. So as the vendor, we need them there through this transition. We also need them to be uh, working with the new vendor to move the databases over, to be able to uh, help us understand how they had things set up so that we can do that transition. Um, you know, the HNTB part of it, the difficulty there is that the subject matter experts on what the ETN system does, all, uh, all are HNTB employees. Sandag does not have the expertise the way that we should if we had a different philosophy where we were own we, we treated our ownership of this a little bit differently. Um, Sandag right now is re was relying on HNTV to implement this. So so that's where the subject matter expertise is. And unfortunately, they also have, for instance, um, they're in charge of our the bugs and the bug trackers and closing those out. So that, that whole process of making sure that the system can still be used during this next 11 months of transition, th those are the charges that are the costs that would be required to do that. If you pull those two pieces out, I don't know that we have a system at that point that that was never you know a, a consideration that, that we would make because that would put us at risk even if it was just hntb but eton was left you feel that the, the same you, you know I, i'll let lucinda weigh in on that um if if she would like to but um i i didn't we didn't bifurcate that from an analysis perspective but please so now as ray was saying before to keep them together because HNTB with, has been with us from the beginning, so they know the insides and outsides of ETAN, and we need ETAN to kind of be stable during that 11 months, and they're they're in the right position to do that for us. I, I appreciate that. My, my concern that I think some of the other board members have raised, or maybe all of them have, have at one point or another, is that when we speak about a vendor that we're going to continue to use on something and yes it may be absolutely necessary which raises another management question which is in the future when we have the systems go into place how do we avoid being in essence held hostage by the vendors that are not performing but to at least to the standard well apparently the standard that requires multi-million dollars in liquidated damages against them but uh, or at least with these two but um my question is can you tell us what you believe the performance was of H and T B? How did they, well did they perform on the two contracts on this on this issue? In 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 my opinion, I think that um, I would have. I don't know exactly what the. I didn't read the entire contract, understand exactly what they they would do, but I would have hoped that if they saw this going awry at some point that it would have been escalated more so that management could have done something about it. And it may have been escalated. I don't know that for a fact. Um, the people who were managing this up until Andre took it over are all gone. Um, and so we haven't asked them firsthand what, what they knew or what h and may have told them was wrong with the system. And, and, yeah. So the, Just not, a, not another spin on it. 
but technically, even though they were the owner's rep, we were still the owners. So it really falls on us to what we allow the, con the consultants to do with the vendor, right? They are telling us what's going on. We're the ones who are supposed to be shuttling the information. So I would say that agent TV did what their contract said, and we were the people administering that contract. I hear you, but obviously if anybody hires anybody from a contractor at your house or a, you know, any type of vendor, and just because I'm the owner in the, of the property, if the vendor does a bad job, I guess you could say it's my fault, but I definitely fire that vendor and sue them for the damages. <laughs> but um, I guess my final comment, and I, I tried to speak as fast as I possibly could, um, I want to make sure that we understand, or I know everybody understands it, I'm not, but I have to remind myself of this, so I'm talking to myself as well. Our OIPA is an independent auditor that I sometimes or others will say is an internal auditor because they're physically located here, which actually is great, and they are allowed to ask for all the information they need. I do believe and our current independent auditor and that she will be truly independent and I just need we just need to make sure that her charge of what she's going to be auditing is broad enough to satisfy what the board needs. But as I've stated multiple times in the past, that when those audits are completed, I strongly ask and recommend that the board support having that be a first thing on an agenda with a sufficient amount of time is here with all of our members and um, chairs to thoroughly analyze publicly because otherwise the audit doesn't really have much effect on us in the future. Thank so you. Council Member Duncan, thank you for that. Um, that has been the direction that I have given um, our OEA director. And um, my goal is that she comes back, she's gathering the information, she's going through the process now. We've met a couple of times in December. Um, she's also been meeting with the team, understands, um, and the team understands that whatever she needs to be able to do her audit and to fulfill the goals, um, she will do that. And so we will make sure that um, I follow up with her so that we can bring her back and give an update of where we are and what the process is gonna be so that you have that. So I appreciate that question. Um, we have a couple of other people on the queue, but I just wanna double check because I know that there's a motion on, on the floor and I better want, can you reinstate your motion? Um, I'm sorry? No, she doesn't ask. No, I understand, but I wanna make sure that I, that it's clear what her motion was so that we can write it up somewhere and figure out if there's a second or not. And if there's not, as of now, there is no second to your motion. So I wanna just double check, cause you were very specific about uh, some of the questions that, that the council member just asked. And so um, I wanna be clear that, you know, the concerns that we have, um, if they if this entity were to continue to do the work with them, there has to be some legal parameters for us to be able to put pressure on the work that needs to get done. It can't just be, well, they're the only people that could do it, so we gotta go with them. And if that's the option that we have to continue on with them because it's how we're gonna meet our goals, then there has to be opportunities for us to create parameters around that, right? I mean, um, you know, I think both, I think everybody around the table can agree that um, there are that we have concerns. What I wanna make sure is as we move forward, what are our parameters and what are the, the barriers for them to be able to continue? So what was your motion? Yeah, thank you, Chair. So my motion is to approve, because that's what we're being asked to do. It doesn't specify what we are approving. It just says what the fiscal impact is. To approve um, this action plan, so my my um, my revision to that action plan would be that we um, do not pay the uh, 2.3 million dollars for the transition because we've already spent 2.9 million based on staff's um, PowerPoint. We've already spent 12.9 million dollars for what we have right now, which is nothing because it hasn't actually happened. So in my opinion, they should be working for free. We already have $12.9 million for a failed system that they have not delivered. I believe that the two point, to pay them $2.3 million is irresponsible on our part. So it would be with the changes of that. So I, I don't know how you would put that in the so, action, I guess, well, with the revisions. There, there hasn't been a second. So I just want to make sure this is the action. Give me one second. 
There, okay. There, this For is the action that discussion. the staff has requested. And so what I want to make sure, look, it's okay, people can second motions, but I, and we can vote it up or down. But I want to make sure that we're very clear about the, what you're requesting. Is that something that we can legally do, right? Because just saying that we're not going to pay anybody doesn't mean that we're not liable for them coming back at us because, you know, we can go back and forth in the courts forever, and then this is going to get stopped. So can somebody please explain what the ramifications of going in that direction would be? The Sure. So the the action that we were asking the board to take was to allow us or to support us in executing a sole source contract to uh, enter into a contract with Deloitte and A to B to replace the system. So this had nothing this this motion had nothing to do with um, ETAN or H and TV. Um, if we don't have ETN during the transition period, I would say we probably don't have a tolling system that it would it would be potentially we we would not be able to have access to it. Is that accurate, Lucinda? We would not have a tolling system, and so we would immediately start to incur. Uh, we would be able to collect revenue, so that would probably impact our our bondholders, and it would uh, impact our our ability to pay off the toll road also. Um, in terms of HNTB, they are the subject matter experts. If you bifurcated the two contracts, the ETN, I, I, would, I would say we have to do that. With HNTB, I think um, it would be extremely painful, but correct me if I'm wrong, it is possible that we could somehow try to manage that part of it. All things are possible. All, all things are possible. All right. Thank you for the clarification. My motion, then I will I will uh, change it, would be to uh, continue with ETAN, though I don't like it. I, it does not sit well with my stomach, but that we would uh, take HNTB out of the equation because they have clearly failed managing it. And since we can do it ourselves, that would be my motion, Chair. You said probably, right? I, yes, we we didn't look at that. I don't think Lucinda is 100% convinced that we could do this ourselves. But I can tell you that if the ETAN part is out, then we have a huge problem. The HNTV part, I think she's telling us that no, and she's the expert. So, so I, I, okay, so, all right, hold on one second. Okay, so, all right, hold on one second. We have the staff recommendation, and then we had a motion that was made by the, by the mayor. And then, then she did a, a separate motion, right? Because the first motion did nobody second. So, but then you had oh, you it, it, no. Actually, there was a, a second. No, there wasn't. Sorry, Sorry. she council member. No, I didn't give anybody second. the room yet. So we have not had because I wanted clarification and I wanted to ask questions, right? So yeah, she'll have to. It since it's my motion, she's already seconded it. I have to change it, and then she would have to um, agree with that change. Can I make a? Uh, is a proper point of order procedure? For, yes, sir. The agenda item is to hire um, A to B and Deloitte. The question of firing the other two vendors is not really on the agenda. Exactly. And so I would certainly entertain that. I think it might be something we'd want to do in closed session because we know where this is headed. I understand. So um, I would rather not consider a motion that included the firing of any I, vendor. I understand, and I appreciate that uh, um, for you mentioning it. What I don't want is for us to leave this meeting and, and it's gonna the, the narrative is gonna be, Chair Vargas said we couldn't do this. So I'm trying to go through this process of being very thorough about the request that you're making. You know, everybody can make a motion, anybody can second it, but I wanna make sure that we understand what the repercussions are of those motions that are being made right now and what the implications are. We can vote it down, we can vote it up. The problem is, is that I do believe that these are some of the items that we need to take to closed session. What I am concerned about is that the experts before me are saying probably and then maybe not. So I'd rather you tell me we don't have the answer for you right now at the moment, board members, 
let us get back to you. And then let's address the item that is before an action, because this is how we end up in situations where we're not able to move forward. So uh, Marcus, give me I, a minute. We okay. have we have had a couple of questions asked and the responses that you have given have been back and forth, unless I'm hearing something different. So I want to make sure we're very clear about what we are saying to our board, what we can or cannot do, because otherwise this is how we end up in situations where Three months ago, you told me we could do something, and here we are three months later saying, no, we can't. And that is 100% not acceptable. If you do not have the information, super fair, super fair, because the other thing about this is that I did ask our leadership to meet with each board member to go through this item, and many people refused to have those conversations with the staff uh, for timing issues, whatever that was, everybody, it's your prerogative to do that. But I wanna make sure we're clear that we are very thorough with 100% yes or 100% no. And if the answer is ambivalent and we don't know, then we don't make that decision on that item because otherwise we're gonna come back and be in this place again three months ago and say, well, you told us that we can have this and then we can't. And then once again, we are not uh, you know, doing what our, the public has asked us to do. So let me go ahead and have, uh, you have a motion yes, on the floor. On the it, yes, it's on the floor. So I haven't uh, finished. After I haven't finished. Let me run the meeting. Give me a second. So we have a motion on the floor. We like have a second. A Give me a second. We have a second. And now you are asking to change that motion. I'd like to respond to, uh, to Mayor Kranz because I think he does have a valid point. And I'd like to respond to that because I'm listening and I'm trying to respond. Yeah. And being that it's my motion, I think I have that right. So based on what's been said here today, my my motion would be that we would yes we would give our executive director the authority to move forward with the new contract however i would like to bring back at our next meeting uh the discussion of whether we not and it doesn't have to do with etan it has to do with hntb whether we would support as a board continuing to have a management company and maybe we'll have more answers from staff and you know chair i a lot of times I, I listen to what's happening and I come up with things that are in my mind as the as the conversation is evolving. I didn't have any plan to have this uh, discussion and make this motion. I literally listen and respond to what's happening and what's being said. And as uh, um, Ray Major was going on with the conversation, that's what made me think this. So my motion would be to move forward in doing what we need to do to continue the project moving along. However, bringing back the management portion, which is $500,000 uh, to HNTB. So that would be my motion. Second. Okay. We have further discussion. Um, Council Member Chu. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, Mayor Jones, for, for making that change to, to your amendments and keeping us on track. Um, you know, I want to keep this short. But I'm not going to ask Ray if, if you can give us an analogy so people can understand. Um, we're dealing with, you mentioned a cloud system. That's why we, we have certain things to, that we have to retain with, with our existing uh, vendor. Um, and the kind of technology and information. And you know, uh, let me give you a, a, my quick, quick my, probably not the best example, but if I don't like AT and I can go to another phone company, right? There's many of them out, out there that have similar technology and it's fine. Um, in this case, do we simply go to many other vendors that are available with this kind of technology and information that we could simply turn off one phone and go to another one? That, can, that cannot happen. Uh, I wish that we could just switch like that, but the entire system, all of the hardware that we have down at the toll offs, the, the computer systems, the telephones that we use, that's all part of the ETAN system. The, 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 all of the connections to the DMV, for instance, that's the ETAN system. We can go to another vendor, but it's going to take 11 months to switch it out. And that is exactly what we're doing now. And the reason is that the, we have to migrate the data. We have to take our 90,000 accounts and we have to move them forward also along with all the other information that is in that system so that the new system can be using it. So it's not as easy as just using another provider. We actually have, we have to move our databases too. So this is a very complicated move. Uh, it's, you know, we, 
I, I'm, I'm 100% confident that we can do it, but it's it's going to take time. It's not as easy as just turning it off. Right, and, and I just want to make that clear. So just like I don't want to change banks, if, if my bank has my tax records and I'm going to lose them and I won't be able to you know, do a good filing the next year if, if I don't do it right. Um, and I really appreciate the, the, the presentation you gave, and I want to commend you guys for really working on and, uh, and giving us uh, the kind of information we need to, to make the right uh, decision. It is late, so I want to keep the discussion low, and I hope we will all move on with this so we can get on with the rest of the agenda. Yes, thank you. I appreciate the report. I appreciate the... Um, <clears throat> apparent vigor with which this issue is now being addressed. Um, it was quite concerning to see caps, the, the, just how far in arrears they are with liquidated damage and, and problems that they have. And I appreciate that you heard the request to bring problems uh, to the fore sooner rather than later, although this still is technically later, but um, uh, this this is uh, uh, these are all good signs, um, and I, in the interest of being brief, will speak directly to the motion. I frankly would rather that the motion was not specific to HNTB, but to both vendors, and I would like to have some assurance that there have been some very difficult conversations with both of those vendors about the projections on these costs, and you know, make sure that that especially Eton knows that um, this board would like for them to be gone as quickly as possible. And so if we are committing to this, we're seeing these two point, these million, multi-million dollar payments to them, maybe our question should be, how much is it gonna cost to keep the cloud system open and not shut that down? Um, the, I wanna make sure that we convey to both of these vendors that their performance has been absolutely unacceptable and that we want them to be uninvolved just as quickly as possible. That said, HNTB is performing this contract management role, and I think everybody knows that as a contract agency, we can do it one of a couple of ways. We can either hire a bunch of personnel to manage the contracts, or we can hire a consultant to provide that service. And we, I think, went the responsible way, which was to hire a consultant to manage it. But somewhere in that management, things went way off track, and it's really unfortunate. But um, I would ask the motion maker if she would consider amending her motion to include a consideration of how to reduce the, mon the amount of money that we continue to pay to Eton. I, I do like that. Um, I'm not sure how we would put that in here because honestly, that I would like to get to that point. The only reason I decided to not put that specifically in here is because Eton staff what staff said that that would be impossible to move without them. But if you if you want to if if you think that having a revision in um, in finding out how much ETA, I'm okay. I'm okay with doing that to bring it back to the next meeting. So we could just figure out how to write that and then it come back and find out if we could pay this much for this service back to the cloud and all of that. And then this much for this service to kind of break that down. Oh, I don't think we're gonna be able to figure that out today. So I guess it would be just then to move forward um, and then come and bring back the transitional piece of it to our next meeting. Right, your motion originally was uh, I don't know if it was part of the motion, but you made the comment. I don't want to pay these people a penny more. Correct. Yes. And I would just add to, I don't want to pay these people a penny more than we have to. And I think we're in a situation where it's yes. pretty clear that we have to have them as part of this transition. And so all I want to make sure is that we don't pay them a penny more than we have to in order to successfully transition to the new system. Yes, and staff has said that we that they felt that we could handle HNTB's part of it, which is great. 
though the ETAN part, if we could just pay certain things, that that would honestly be best. I mean, I'm thinking about because people go, oh, it's Sandex money. It's not Sandex money. It's our taxpayer money. So um, I, I think that um, taking them out, bringing back the transitional part of this at our next meeting, I could totally get on board with that. Yeah, and then, uh, the, the last point I would like to make is that HNTB, I, I think, you know, clearly they are a big part of the operations here at Sandex. And as a, I would hope they value the relationship with Sandag, and I would hope that they recognize that they've cre been a part of a debacle, and that if they want to continue the relationship with Sandag, it's in their best interest to make, to 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 resolve this issue for less than five hundred thousand dollars, maybe even for free. Well, again, but, yeah, back to, yeah, back to my point. We've already paid them four point three million dollars, and we correct. literally haven't. They oh, failed. Absolutely. Yes. So, so yeah. Yes. Um, so, do you want to go ahead and, John? Let me go ahead and have him. The, the one point we have to recognize here is that while you're considering a modification to your motion, that motion has been seconded, and it now belongs to the whole of the body rather than the maker and the seconder. However, the whole of the body could consent to that by unanimous consent if there's no objection to it. So just a recognition that anyone has, if you want to consider amending the motion, anyone, any member can object to that. If you do object to it, then we'd have to take a formal vote as to whether to allow the amendment to happen. If nobody objects, it can be considered approved by unanimous consent. Oh, we took a try to just happened. Yeah, oh, I see, okay, okay. The motion that we understand is now on the floor is that the board of directors is asked to authorize a chief executive officer to execute a sole source contract for a new back office system and direct staff to bring an item to the next board meeting to discuss options to reduce costs during the transition to the new back office system, including the role of HNTB related to management of the toll road operations system. Both both entities. Okay, I'll ask staff to modify it so what you see on the on the board includes that. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Just a question, John. Does does that discussion lend itself more to closed session or to open session? If we're talking about potential initiation of litigation, there's where we could go to closed session. But if we're simply talking about an amendment to a contract or strategy and executing a contract, that would need to be an open session. So how would we know the difference between the two now? We don't know. I mean, to me, it seems like they're is a lot of leverage that we have, as was pointed out by Mayor Kranz with um, HNTB, Eton has a little bit of leverage over us. And so um, I, I, I just would feel a little bit more comfortable having this discussion in closed session um, and, um, to clear up some of the litigation potentials and then having it um, after we have some answers. Or do you think you could do that uh, comfortably in open session? I'd say that based upon the, what we understand the questions to be here today, there have been um, expressed concerns about the performance of various entities that are under contract with Sandike. We can bring to you a focused discussion on the potential initiation of litigation in order to address those deficiencies. If you wanna go beyond that, that would need to be an open session. And it, it could be a combination of the two even. Yeah, and it doesn't prevent us as a board to be able to have discussions about accountability and and some of the, what we are directing our, our new uh, CEO, right? Acting CEO to make sure that they're very clear about as we're moving forward and Ray under his new role to make sure that they understand how important this is to the board and that this is not, um, this can't continue, right? I, I, that has, doesn't have to be done in closed session and we can have that conversation. Once we go into much more in depth, I think that would be a very okay, different conversation. Good. Well, just to continue my brief remarks, and that is, first of all, I wanna thank um, Ray and the team for really diving deep into this, um, so much for your Christmas vacation. Um, but I appreciate this and the transparency that you show, the willingness to answer the questions directly, very much so. And I, I think everything has been said about, you know, we're all angry about, you know, the, the mess up. And I appreciate that Sandig is admitting that we, you know, kind of screwed up in some areas too, and have identified areas where we can fix them. I think the most important 
area of focus for improvement is to adopt Sandega's owner philosophy, including increased vendor management. I think that is super important, not just for this particular project that we have, um, the I-25 or the 125, but also can we look at where else in the agency we might be vulnerable to this sort of an approach um, where we have been a little bit too hands off with our vendors. I mean, it is smart to use vendors. You know, we as small cities, we don't have a bunch of staff we, to do things. We hire, we go out for our piece and hire consultants to do things for us. But we, you know, we're small enough that we have um, a lot of oversight over that. So I would just um, also encourage staff to look at the entire or organization. As far as um, auditors, I mean, it seems like we've got a lot of auditors on, on the job here. We've got the OIPA, we've got, um, uh, Fagan and Davis Farr um, in different roles. And I think that we're aud being, everything that we're looking at has adequate um, oversight, eyes on it in terms of independence and I'm reviewing it all. So I, I think we're good that way. And I I'm appreciate that the um, Courtney Ruby is here and that she's got um, a plan of action, some of it by February, which is important for us, my understanding is to receive federal funds so that we can continue to receive those so that we can get you know, that portion of it, the um, accounting uh, of the tolling um, taken care of and the understanding of the customer accounting errors. Those are the parts that have to be done early, right? That is true. We have to have those audits finished by March 31st and all of the parties who are involved in those audits are aware of that date and they're committed to having that finished before March 31st. So we shouldn't have a problem, but we're just making you aware that that is a hard deadline. Great. Yeah. Well, I, I feel comfortable that we've got our arms wrapped around um, like the, the, the issues and that we have a plan of action going forward. Appreciate the discussion and how we came to where we are and um, look forward to continuing to get the updates from you um, January 12th forward. Appreciate it. Uh, Councilmember Moreno. Um, I appreciate the work by Mr. Major in stepping into the breach to try to fix this broken system. Um, this was not an easy task, and I appreciate your willingness to take it on. Um, I am concerned that we're proposing to spend $31.7 million on uh, new vendors to set up a new backup system, as well as $1.8 million to our existing vendors to handle this changeover in order to continue charging tolls on the SR-125, which is the only freeway in our county without um, any general purpose lane that, um, any general purpose lanes that are free to the public to use. Um, instead, uh, South County residents are forced to pay tolls to drive on their local highways. Uh, South County residents are being charged twice for the same road. Uh, they paid the money through their taxes that Sandag used to purchase the 125, and they pay every single time they use it. Um, I have been concerned for many years about the basic inequity of this system since Sandag purchased the 125 over a decade ago. Um, in order to relieve itself of the obligation of expanding the 805, Sandag purchased the 125, which saved it quite a bit of money. Uh, but this came at the price of charging South County residents tolls to drive on a freeway that many of them rely upon for local trips. Um, I want to point out that no other part of the region is treated in this way. Uh, before spending additional money on this broken system, I would like to see staff seriously analyze the potential cost and benefits for removing the tolling on the 125 entirely. Uh, my second concern is the nature of this whole source agreement. Uh, given that our problem here uh, was severe underperformance by a contractor, um, I'm not sure that the solution to this is a rushed sole source contract. Uh, um, also, there could be questions raised that the contractor we chose for this sole source contract is the same team that we brought in um, on a sole source contract to help us analyze the feasibility of data migration to an, a new vendor. Um, I, am I am concerned that this raises the appearance that the chosen vendor could have used their existing sole, sole source contract to get an insider's track on a new sole source contract. And for those reasons, um, and honestly, as a lifelong South Bay resident, um, I'm absolutely not in support of staff's recommendation um, or the motion on the floor today. That concludes my comments, thank you. Thank you, Councilman Moreno. And just to point out uh, that we were very specific about that question in the fall. So 
we were very, we asked, the board asked, I'm not sure, um, I wanna make sure that we acknowledge that because I think it's a very important question. The question was, is Deloitte the only other person that could do this, right? And and you all answered. So can you go, do you remember that question that we asked? Um, I sure. wanna make sure that's on the record because I think it's really important, right? Because we all had this conversation during the meeting in December about how we were concerned about that transition and going through another sole uh, uh, contractor, so if you could just address that, I think it would be important for our constituents to understand that point. Sure, so Deloitte is not the only contractor that we talked to. We didn't go out for an RFP, we talked to six different uh, firms that do this and uh, explained what the what the issues were and g tried to gain an understanding of whether or not they were able to do what we needed, which is to quickly replace this system. The reason that we are looking for a sole source is that if is that if we had to go out for an RFP, that would add probably another at least twelve to eighteen months to the process, mm -hmm. which means that we would be on this ETAN system for another three years, and then we would have to continue to pay ETAN and most likely HNTB to support that system until we could select another vendor. Um, the, the Deloitte solution that, that we selected is a, is a world-class solution, the A to B system. Um, as, I, as I talked a little bit about, it's, it is up and running right now with, uh, with a tremendous number give of me, us. Uh, give me a second, colleagues. I'm gonna ask that you hold off on your side comments while um, our staff, our team is speaking. I think it's really important that we hear what yeah. they have to say. Go ahead, sir. I'm sorry, we, 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 we did vet this, this uh, vendor and we, we saw the system, we saw the system up and running. Um, they have over 2000 miles of, of lane miles that they, that they have under management right now. We would be adding 10 plus our, our, our 20 miles of, of fast track lane. So um, th they're, they're very capable to do it. Big problem that we had last time is that we decided that we were going to go with a, a, a smaller company. This is now we're going with a big company. It's the new Sandag philosophy for the last couple of years is that we go with the state of the art um, companies. We buy off the shelf things rather than building it ourselves. And I think that's what's going to lead to the success of this. But we did talk to six other companies and we've been working with Deloitte prior to, uh, to probably October um, in, in terms of really specifying what this looks like. Thank you. Council. And if I could, as you make a decision here, one of the points that is before you is whether or not to approve the sole source. These are local funds. And so the, the appropriate standard for that is in your board policy. Board policy 16 uh, allows a sole source procurement um, on two things that I think are relevant here. Either that there's only one consultant capable of providing the services because the services are unique or highly specialized. It would also be allowed if the services are essential to maintain research or operational continuity. So merely, with all deference to Ray, merely the fact that somebody is good isn't enough. You need to base your decision upon one of those two criteria or both of them. Uh, Mayor Minto. Thank you. Um, quite frankly, I think this is really a lot easier than it sounds. Uh, bottom line is, has to be done. We can take as much time as we need to complete any investigations, which I think they're underway. Um, I support the uh, motion by Mayor Jones completely because it gets things started. I like the idea of coming back, but I uh, discussed this later on, but I think it should start out in a uh, open session. Uh, if it turns to the point where the uh, board of directors is looking at uh, litigation, it's easy just to stop and say, okay, we need to come back with this you know, in closed session. Uh, and the reason why I say that is because it's important for everybody that's involved, people that are in the public that are uh, having concerns about what's going on, can see what is happening and which way it's going. And I think most people understand that when it comes to litigation, you don't want that in the uh, public because then it tips off your hand, for instance, to whoever the defendant might be in that case, uh, where you're going with it and they can, create a defense before they ever uh, get to court or before they ever get to even a uh, conference. Um, I think that um, the sole source idea was very well explained. I, and I do remember from uh, before, previously, we talked about having uh, talked to several different vendors and none of them really could 
give a um, bid because they couldn't do the work. And if you can't do the work, why would you get involved in a request for proposals? So therefore, um, I said, let's get this thing going now uh, so that we don't have any um, delays. And you know, one other thing is I might say is uh, when you talked about why we couldn't for, uh, I think it was 2029 or 27, something like that, pay off this. I think maybe if you come back, Ray, with a, or even send something out to us about the timeline on why you can't do it any sooner than that might be helpful. Thank you. Uh, can I call for the question, please? Oh. So I think we're, when there's still people in the queue to discuss. And so we're going to go ahead. Point of procedure. Um, yes, I'm I, the last one in the queue. I feel like, oh, okay. Okay, so take a um, the question has been called. Right. A, a motion to a call the question is a motion to end debate. A motion to end debate goes to the body and it requires a two thirds vote of the body in order to adopt that. All right. So I was just following procedure. So Okay, council member. Okay. Deputy Mayor Gasterland of Del Mar. Um, so I'm coming at this with a master's degree in computer science and distributed data systems and a PhD in computer science in query answering with uncertain information that changes over time. That's the thinking I'm bringing to the table. And so I'm stepping back and asking. So first I'm thanking, I wanna thank Mr. Major, for the discussion that we had, a lengthy discussion on Wednesday. And I do think that if the assumption is that we need to replace the current system, you've laid out an appropriate path to do it. So that goes to the assumptions behind, do we replace the current system at all? And a second one is, do we continue with charging tolls this year while that replacement is happening. And the reason I ask this is this system depends on the fast track transponder that probably every one of us has in our car. And the fast track transponder goes through a sensor on SR-125 highway. And depending on how far you drive, you're charged. That charge is a request sent from the SR-125 computer, which Eton controls, over to the state to find out, hey, deduct this money. And then that money comes from the state to some system, presumably some centralized accumulator account. And then it gets resolved against the Sandag um, finances, it, it's added. So what I'm seeing here is, it all depends on the fast track transponder. And if you had a clean new system with no users yet, every new car that goes through one of the detectors would now become a new customer. So we're hearing 90,000 customers. And I would wonder, are those 90,000 customers who have ever used SR-125, um, or are they the users of the last year? And if I do the math and I divide the number of trips on SR-25 by the number of customers, it's 188 trips per year. So I hear my fellow board member and the, the discussion of the inequity, um, it comes down to 11.1 .1 million a year being charged of the people using SR-125. And the system in place for I-15 works. So what we're really talking about is spending close to $40 million to replace the SR-125 broken system. And it, so if you do the math, it, you know, it's $40 million and it's a break even over a four year period. So I would ask, can we simply suspend the tolling this year and take a little while longer to revisit, do we do this back end system? If this board could make the decision to simply suspend tolling with all its brokenness and with the 12 people downstairs who are gonna be answering the phone call and pretty much every person who uses SR-125 ask, calling in to check, is my bill right? Because we have no way of even knowing. Um, I would make a substitute motion to suspend the tolling 
this year with the current system, to suspend the current system completely and come back in two months or two weeks, whatever the appropriate amount of time is, with the question again, do we do the new back office system or do we just leave it as is and try to recover this 11.1 million a year in a different way? That would be my substitute motion. Happy to second the substitute motion. Can I uh, just add some clarification? The system, the back office system is for both the 150. The oh, I, I fully understand that. But can't the cut off half. No, I totally understand that. However, the I-15 is not broken. I'm not talking about suspending I-15. I'm talking about suspending SR-125. So I've been seconded, and I would ask the board to call the question on the substitute. And that's my comment. Thank you. Excuse me, Chair. Can you please repeat the motion? As I understand it, it is to suspend polling on the 125 and to come back in two months to analyze whether it is recommended to reinstate it at that point. Is that accurate? Well, not reinstate, not reinstate the tolling, but to move forward with the back office. Is your motion to suspend it immediately or at some point in time? I would suspend it immediately, but as 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 soon as is feasible. I, I think Ray has a comment. I just have to caution that as a board votes, you have to be mindful of your covenants to bondholders yeah. and the significant legal implications. And of could we come back with information? Here's the, the problem. Um, I am moving forward with these motions and substitute motions. I think there's a lot of information that is, it sounds wonderful. And I think that could be an option that we can ask the staff to come back and say, if we did this in your transition plan, what would that look like? But but I feel that um, people are really enthusiastic about what, how they want to move forward with their motion. So I'm letting you all, let's go ahead. We have a motion and a second. We know what the implications are. Our legal counsel just informed us. So you have a motion and a second before you. So I make please. a point of clarification yes, very sir. quickly. I just wanted to make sure because sometimes you speak a little bit softly, listen to and your words are important. If you did, you say a moment ago when uh, to um, there are board member from Del Mar that you cannot bifurcate the tolling and that if we vote to stop the tolling on the 125, it will stop the tolling on the 15. So we have a motion that doesn't say anything about the 15 that will, may stop all the tolling on the 15. So we might wanna actually know that before we vote on it, if that's yeah. accurate. This is, yeah, this issue is much more complicated than just turning it off. And can we come back to you at a later date with the information in terms of what the ramifications are of uh, turning off the tolling to our bondholders and to revenue, et cetera? That would have been my, my request to you, but we have a motion that was also second, and now you have information. And so we can either pull the motion or we can just vote on it, vote it up and down, and then we'll deal with the legal implications. How about that? She did, yeah, so we have a motion, a substitute motion before us. So can you please vote on this, knowing what you know? Well, you need help? it's okay. If people don't want to vote, they don't have to vote. So no need to, you know. Okay. If people need help, just go ahead. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. So I, um, we have a motion on the floor. We still have council member Duncan. I went ahead and cleared up um, the list. So uh, motion fails. Council member Duncan, you had a comment to the previous motion. Um, is there anybody else that I missed from the short list before the, the, there was a, um, the question was called when the question was called, I only had the deputy, uh, uh, the deputy. deputy mayor and council member Duncan. That's all I have on the list. So council member Duncan, you have the last word. Thank you. I, I'll be quick. I just want to address a couple of the comments that were made by the other board members, because I think we actually have some answers to some of those questions. 
One of the first ones about Eton knowing that we want to be done with them as soon as possible, and we want to spend as least amount of money on them as possible. As Mayor Pans mentioned, we sent them a notice to cure in October 2023 with over $6.45 million and or close to it at that time in liquidated damages. They well know that we're trying to get rid of them as soon as possible. If we, I, I don't believe, I would hope, I'm just, I'll mention it, I'll vote for the motion if that's what, nobody wants to change it again, we need to move forward. But I would just hope that the staff doesn't spend very much time reviewing the situation where we already know everything that we know about Eton. We are gonna pay them the least amount of possible to get rid of them as soon as possible. And if we don't, mm -hmm. we will suffer much larger damages financially. With h and I wish the motion said, we were removing them from the project now. And that is regardless of whether the staff can do it or whether we need to get one of these other apparently large consulting firms, many of which we apparently have on many of our projects to come into their will and take it over. Because the best way to send a message to a super financially viable entity like HNTB is to say you failed us on this project and you're not continuing on it. Then their future with us might look different either with how it goes or whether we use them at all. But I just wanted to make that clear. We are not giving up our ability to sue Eton by paying them a little bit more to finish this. That was my understanding in our discussions. Ray, is that accurate? I think that's accurate, yes. And then the final question is, when our general counsel says we need to have a legal basis for why we're voting on this motion, I would just like to state on the record the reason I will vote for it is because in order to have operational continuity, I believe we have to do this as a sole source uh, contract on an emergency basis. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a motion and a second. Please vote. I just want the record to show that I am the B vote for San Diego, and I want it, the um, record to show that I'm voting no. But it says A. Oh, okay. They have to just. So you voted. You voted. Voted no for A, B, but you can't. B's going. It should be San Diego. Okay. Yeah, well, we'll fix well, the slide. Okay. Thank you for the thorough discussion. Point of, point of order, my, my vote's not showing up. Okay. What would you like you to say? you want to tell us your vote? It's public. Aye. Okay. Wonderful. We'll note it. Anyone else? All right. Motion carries. <laughs> uh, we will make sure that uh, that uh, our team follows up with all of you, uh, and we, we'll come back with the timeline and additional information as well. All right, the next item on the agenda is the revised fiscal year 2024 position classification salary range table. I'm gonna turn it over, uh, before I turn it over, one second, before I turn it over to Colleen, I'm just gonna turn everything over to the vice chair, um, the second vice chair, uh, Lisa Hebner, to continue on with the meeting. Go ahead. Okay. So very briefly, um, because we know time is tight, the revised 2024 position classification and salary table over the last few months, we have made various repurposing of existing positions within the organization. CalPERS requires that we bring those change in position titles, note them within the classification table and have that approved by the board of directors. So that is what is before you today. I wanna to make it very clear, this does not have budget implications. We are not adding any headcount as a result of this. We are not making any budgetary changes. So that is the recommendation and it's before you here today. All right, we're gonna go ahead and have a public comment. I have eight public commenters on this item. Consuelo, please come to the podium. You'll be followed by Mark. So let's see. 
So regarding this item, as I said earlier, like why are we even here? What good has Sandeg and their reckless management really done for our county besides made loads of money off the Cash Cow County residents? Let's simplify things already because clearly you are falling, you are failing at keeping up with projects and bettering the county. You keep using our money for your failed projects and the public clearly are not paying attention to anything you all are doing, yet they're the ones putting the bill. Come on, San Diego, get involved and see for yourselves where your hard-earned money is going. It's going to the Sandak Corporation and they're behaving beyond reckless, careless, and sloppy with our money, your money. I love how, where'd she go? Where'd she go? She escaped. I love how when the media cameras are gone, you start up with your pouncing, especially on Rebecca. You love playing it up you love playing up your soft tone for the cameras. We see right through you, Vargas. Our next commenter, Mark, please come to the podium. You'll be followed by Truth. Well, this is about raising the salaries of people that are really little fish in the system. Of course, they've been indoctrinated in their education to uh, help you and that the only way they're going to make money from their education is to work for organizations like you or the main way so they're they're kind of forced into it uh, but um it's really sad because uh the reason you have to raise their pay so often is because of inflation and the average person whose groceries have tripled and whose bills have doubled simply doesn't get paid raises like this and they're being crushed it's causing homelessness you guys never point this out or address it the mayor was really really he just boldly lied it was either yesterday or the day before uh, where he was saying that the solution is building homes well it's not it's stopping inflation so people can build their own homes and getting rid of the fees and and uh, that and permits that prevent people from building your time has expired. Next commenter, Truth, please come to the podium. You'll be followed by Alan. I'm not a big fan of certain principal regional planners. Some of them tell tall tales, have no real interest in improvements, and refuse to include my posted ideas at Sandag workshops. Yet they make up to $150,000 a year. As a government relations analyst or money seeker, I'm glad there's a deputy independent auditor, but my favorite job classification is various. I might actually be qualified for that. I don't know what a manager of learning and development is. Is that to help the board members understand the effects of bad projects like $4 million a mile bike lanes on our communities? But there's definitely some fraud type behavior, maybe collusion and corruption, because Hassan practically started at the CEO max range of $462,000. Then he got bonus after unearned bonus to put him well into the $500,000 range. Maybe because he was so dedicated to selling the no drive agenda. He even walked the streets of San Diego. I live in downtown and I walk to the office. What are you walking through? Shit, I say it very politely. That's for Todd. Thank you for making the city of San Diego that. Your time expired. Ellen, please come to the podium. You'll be followed by Jane Park. Thank you, Terry. Trying to do the right thing. I'm just so disappointed the rest of the board did not try to stop the toll with all the public distrust. Okay, this is directed to council, John Kirk. John Kirk. I understand, correct me if I'm wrong, these fees, you get $150 to attend these board meetings. So $150, if you spend eight hours here, you're making only 60 bucks an hour. So sure, why don't we get two minutes for the public to comment? I quote the Brown Act, 5494, section 3B. Public comment as well as specifying reasonable speaker time limit on particular po topics and individuals. Sir, when we do the consent today, five items, that's just 10 seconds per item. That is breaking the Brown Act. Start taking charge, sir. You are our counsel for the people. One minute is not enough time to speak. I had so much stuff to talk about that transnet and what they're doing with the toll road of hurting the people. 15 seconds, 10 seconds, not enough time to speak. One minute is not enough time to speak. Your time has expired. Our next commenter, 
Jane Park will be followed by the final two, Paul the Bold and the original draw. Jane Park, please go ahead. You are self muted. I will go ahead and go with Paul the Bold. Paul, please go ahead. Okay, the Paul the Bold, by the way. Um, the summary says, uh, quote, several mid-year changes to the salary range table are proposed to meet the operational needs of the agency, end quote. We should know these, or at least have an estimate. What do the headings minimum, midpoint, and maximum actually mean? I didn't see it in the documents. In the interest of transparency, by the way, it would be nice to see some totals for how much the taxpayers will actually be on the hook for. I did not see any overall figures in the documents. So, uh, you know, guys, I mean, we're paying for all this taxpayer money. Please, please be more transparent about your financial operations. Thank you. I will try Jane the Park again. Jane, if you're available, please go ahead. We'll move on to the original draw. Please go ahead. You're taking millions of dollars for salaries for positions that are, you know, pretty much should be obsolete. They are, but however, you still are there. And so are the people working so hard to, you know, basically destroy San Diego because you guys are sitting here and you're talking about experts and the only experts that you're going to use are ones who failed. So like, how can you call someone who's failed an expert? But that's the kind of stuff that we have here and all of this negligence where it's like, you want the people to continue to pay for things they've already paid for. And here we're paying you to make us pay for more things that we already paid for. And so at some point, this needs to stop. And it's why you guys should be up, like not in this position. If we got rid of you, we wouldn't have all of these issues. You're the ones that create all the problems and then offer the solutions that are far worse, acting like you're doing really good for the people. But it's obvious in the way that you guys vote and do things that you're not. You shouldn't even be paid. And that concludes the public comments. Very good, thank you. Um, this is the time for member discussion. Um, anybody have anything you'd like to say? Staff recommendation is to approve the, rec the uh, mid-year changes to the San Diego Fiscal Year 2024 position class classification salary range table. May I have a motion for that? I will move such. Council Member Shu, second. Um, Vice Mayor? Uh, Council Member. Council Member Lewis. Um, please vote. That item passes with those members present. Very good. This brings us to uh, consent. Any members pulled cons any items off of consent? I see. Uh, Council Member Brookholder. Yes, please. May I pull item number eight? A8, which is approval of proposed solicitations and contract awards already. Okay, we'll go to public comment on all of them. Thank you. I have four in-person commenters and four virtual commenters, five virtual commenters. Truth, please come to the podium. You'll be followed by Consuelo. And I'll just make note that this is for all the items on the consent agenda. Okay, thank you. Item six, over a million dollars from the Department of Injustice, not to take away people's firearms, no, just to make it impossibly difficult and expensive to obtain them so poor people are vulnerable to crime, just like sandbag with cars and driving. In fact, also with phony skewed data from the new cybers and system, as I learned at the Public Safety Committee. 
a system that says gambling is a crime against society while rape is not. And if law enforcement needs funding, too bad, because the new numbers say crime's at an all-time low. Item seven, there's a grammatical error under the part about the city of El Cajon. Item eight, $10 million with $20 million in contracts. That math doesn't make sense, Terry, get on that. And neither do toll lanes and congestion taxes that actually increase VMT and GHGs. And public outreach. Nobody I've ever asked has said they know what Sandag is. MBI Media, looking at their website, they ain't gonna sell nobody on their COVID lies, their climate cult chicken little lies. And item nine. Jack Shoe, what if everyone's answer to your question was they'd like to see a new chair, especially with the censorship that I saw in that last meeting? Thank you, your time expired. Our next commenter, Consuelo, will be followed by Alan. I'll be, yeah, talking about public outreach. And yep, you are failing because as Truth just mentioned, nobody knows this corporation exists. Perhaps you can, um, contact the media because they, they like to, to show up only for highlights. They don't like to stay and see what is truly going on. They don't see the pattern and how the majority of the politicians, especially at the Board of Supervisors, uh, how they work. They just are there for um, fabricating and uh, reporting lies. So how about having the media get involved, report when these meetings take place, um, just make it big, every single outlet, KPBS, Fox News, KUSI, all of them. That way the public, the county, the cash cows really know what's going on and where their money's going, their hard earned money. Our next commenter, Ellen. Please come to the podium. You'll be followed by Mark. Council, another violation Brown Act. Item 8 was just pulled. Are we going to be allowed to discuss on separate? That's a Brown Act. But right now they tell us no, so I'm going to continue. Item 6, camping ban. Downtown San Diego only applied to uh, public location. I invite this entire board Tuesday. We're going to do a big homeless outreach. Check your inbox. I sent you an email the other day. I'm going to expand on that, send another PowerPoint. If you care, if you do care, get involved. I suggest using an empty TRICARE building, put the unhoused 300, you can immediately solve the problem there. So, so we're not allowed to speak again. I, agenda eight, keep in mind that you're giving more money to them bastards. She's left now. Let's go so she can fund the sales tax, a permanent sales tax on the ballot this November. Why would you pay them just so they can get more money to tax you more? Isn't there some corruption there, Mr. Council? I yield back. Our next commenter, Mark, please come to the podium. You will be followed by Alex Wong, who will be followed by the original draw. Or your program budget strategic framework is bullshit. Uh, the whole thing is just full of UN uh, UN Agenda 21 goals. Um, the people don't know about or want. Just about nobody, as was stated, knows about you at all. Even those you guys exist. You were not elected to do these jobs. You were elected to positions on councils um, uh, or with the Board of Supervisors of different cities, so on. Um, Eight uh, is so conflicting, it's such bullshit. It says to uh, reduce congestion. Well, obviously, taking lanes away and making them pay lanes is going to make much more congestion. And your entire agenda is full of conflicts because it's intended to screw us. And it does. And it is. And people can't afford it. Um, uh, six, you're the fiscal agent. You get 10%. For your UN agenda goals, like that, that's absurd. People don't know that. Your um, time expired. Our next commenter, Alex Wong, you'll be followed by the original draw. Alex Wong, please go ahead. Yes, excuse me. First of all, is this the non agenda public comments? I thought I heard this is agenda. The comments on the consent agenda as uh, amended item eight was pulled. Oh, there is no non-agenda public comment. The only people that will be called at the end of the meeting were continued from the beginning. Non-agenda public comments were already taken at the start. 
Mm, if you okay. want to speak on any unprecedented agenda, please go ahead. If not, I, I will ask you to um, move on. No, I do not. Thank you. I will move on. The original draw. Please go ahead. Safe neighborhoods. What a joke. Because, you know, you're just getting $1.33 million dollars of the people's money to pretend to make safe neighborhoods all while our border is being breached and we're paying for human trafficking across the board it's so great and yesterday was like uh human trafficking day or just like you know acknowledging it it's so good um and then you know why are these um tda audits extending probably because they need more information and there's stuff to being hidden in there but all of these solicitation contracts you guys are talking about a bunch of propaganda that you're going to brainwash the public with more travel choices reduce vmts that's true that's actually true congestion reduction no improved mobility no you are taking our ability to travel you are taking the roads from us you are taking the parking spots you are incentivizing people to um you're using our money to de-incentivize driving and so spending you know 10 and 20 million dollars on any million dollars on this is totally bogus and it's fraud waste and abuse because you're using it to lie to the people your time expired. Our next commenter, Blair B. You will be followed by Paula Bold and the final commenter, phone number 899. Blair, go ahead. All right, Blair Beekman. Uh, I wanted to comment that uh, you're, you'll be getting new uh, uh, federal funding dollars for safe neighborhoods. Um, that's gonna translate into uh, technology, basically, new surveillance and data collection tech. San Diego has just put in a ton of new uh, surveillance tech with its smart streetlight program. Uh, cities across California are getting a ton of money for the future of the ALPRs from federal funding dollars. You guys have had a lot of success actually reducing violent crime in the last few years that uh, surveillance tech has been a part of. Why do we need to dump tons more technology when we have program success? It really signals that things are already working well. And we really have to practice minimal uses of future technology use, not dumping, not dumping in more and more technology. Uh, we like tech. Things are working positively. That doesn't mean we dump in a whole bunch of new tech. And that's the sort of lessons we have to really learn for ourselves. It's going to take time. I hope you your time expired. Paul the Bold, please go ahead. You'll be followed by the final commenter, phone number 899. You're self-muted. Uh, Paula Bold, in this time of huge state and federal debt, which raises the prospect for recession or worse, we cannot afford to spend our taxpayer dollars willy-nilly. Repeat after me, it is our money, not yours. And as Blair pointed out, we already have low crime, so why do we need to monitor it more? Um, we all want to see less gun violence, but we need to be transparent about the need for taxpayer funds in excess of county funds. Do we need an extra bureaucratic layer? The documents should say, but don't. Why are we accepting federal funds for what should be part of the county's law enforcement job? And to what agencies and for what purposes are we passing through the majority of these funds? I mean, maybe it's going to you for some kind of graft purposes. Your time expired. Our final commenter, phone number 899, please go ahead. <clears throat> Hi, Mary Davis. I'm concerned, uh, this is for item six, I'm concerned about the lack of details on the project safe neighborhood and what the data and research will consist of. After seeking, uh, seeing the county's gun violence reduction workshops, I'm here to ask for neutral structuring in your data collection and to put emphasis on primary factors that seem to drive the preponderance of gun violence, including no bail, low bail, early release, and reduced charges. Two recent examples, a pre-Christmas road rage murder of an innocent four-year-old boy in Lancaster, California. The suspect was a felon in possession of a gun. The second was a 20-year-old who ran an illegal 3D gun manufacturing operation out of an RV in Escondido. 
uh, despite being originally charged with 28 felonies and facing up to 10 years in state prison, that was pled down the final deal, a single count of unlawful conversion of a firearm into a machine gun, resulting in just one year in jail, two years of probation. Please follow the Pareto principle. Far more emphasis needs to be placed. Your time expired. That concludes the public comments. Very good. Thank you. Um, let's, uh, may I have a motion to approve consent as amended, and then we'll go to A8. Second motion by Kime and second by Dasterland. Please vote. <laughs> vote on your own little devices. That motion passed with those members present and one no. Very good. Let's go to um, item A8, Council Member Burkholder. Yes, thank you. I'll try to make this relatively quick. Okay. I had the same question as um, Truth. Is it 10 million or is it $20 million? And in the staff report, it says staff has estimated an aggregate amount of 10 million for this project over a five year period. Is that the period 2019 to 2024 or I don't know. Are you referring to the sustainable transportation solicitation? I'm referring to page 40 of the staff report, about three quarters of the page down, where it says Sandag conducted a, a procure, procurement for these services in 2019. Right. Those contracts are expiring in June of 2024. So our new contract we're estimating is going to be $10 million. It will be awarded in June mm -hmm. of 2024 and go through 2030. The, the um, expiring contracts, did we spend $10 million on those? How much? We've spent about $7 million on the existing contract. Okay, thank you. On the, on the second page, page 41, I think of the staff report, it says the total value of each contract awarded from the solicitation will be the aggregate value of all task orders and task order amendments awarded. Can you provide, I, I feel like that's a bunch of garbly gook for me. If you could provide an example or like a real world example of that, yes. I would appreciate it. So the solicitation value cannot exceed $20 million. So we're awarding nine contracts. All of the task order work that is done under those nine contracts will be tracked to that $20 million. We will not exceed that amount for all the task orders. So we don't know until the work comes right. up and we do like many competitions amongst the on-call vendors. And so that's the cap that we hold them all to right okay. not each contract yeah right so that makes all. sense thank you <laughs> you're welcome um and then on the attachment one there's this ranking system one to nine or one to eight maybe what what did the rankings mean the rankings are a result of the evaluation committee's uh, uh, rankings across several criteria. So it's usually like the project team they're offering up, their experience, also cost gets factored in there, and then their interviews, how they did in their interviews. And so the top ranked firm for like category A was Brown Marketing. Right. And okay. then category B was MBI Media, but all of these firms are getting an award. Okay, and then I, I'd love to see the breakdown per company for each category um, because we have the, the marketing paid media. And, and here's why. Um, I don't know how effective, I think uh, Consuela maybe um, mentioned this. I don't know how effective the public outreach was, but I do see in the um, annual report that only 4,100 participants, 2,100 in person and 2,000 online provided feedback for the regional plan. So I question when we have these expensive outreach things, if they're really giving us a return on the investment of the taxpayer. Um, so I'd love to see some, if there is data that supports that beyond just 2,100 people were there and 2,000 people wrote an email. Because to me, that's point, I don't zero zero one percent of the population in San Diego County. So then what's the return? I just really wonder about that. And could we do it more efficiently solely online or something like that, you know, um, I, I think it's a, it's a good question. And then um, if this passes, and I'm sure we will pass this, but how often will we get an update on expenditures and estimated costs to include a breakdown of those vendors that we hired? 
Uh, currently, we do not report that information out to you on a regular basis. I know Bill Wells, uh, the mayor of El Cajon, just requested <laughs> any contracts over $5 million yeah. with expenditures per year. So I'm sure that will come into rotation. But, um, you know, we're happy to be transparent as you want with Perfect. the uh, data that we collect. Thank you. I really appreciate that. It helps me uh, on this item a lot. Thanks. No more questions. Would you like to make a motion? I move that we approve this uh, item eight. Okay. And second by Minto. Thank you. Please vote with your own devices. There we go. That item passes with those members present. All righty. Um, now, before we go to closed session, let's go ahead and take the uh, continued non-agenda public comments. Thank you, Vice Chair. I do have six continued non-agenda public comments from the beginning of the meeting. If you're still present, um, Alan, please come to the podium. You'll be followed by Truth, who will be followed by Consuelo. Tuesday, 5 p.m. City Hall. Watch my fire down there. Let me tell you a story about Health County Building down in Chula Vista, Oxford Street. That's a magnet for drug tents next to elementary Harborside School. There are literally 40 drug tents next to that county building. Here's a free cannabis card. Walk up the street. There's a blood plasma donation center, $400 for four pints. A little further, California phones, free Drug phones, thank you, taxpayers. Walk up a little further. Not one, but two cannabis shops in the same parking lot. Cardenas' plan. There's your problem with the homeless. It's a drug problem, and we're not taking care of them. My solution, TRICARE down in front of Costco, down in Chula Vista, has been empty for a year. Use that. Look at your abandoned facilities. There's, there's an Albertsons on somewhere else that's empty. Use that. You can service 300 homeless immediately. And call out San Diego City. They shut down a 550-bed shelter downtown. They failed. That could have been a homeless center, service 550 people, and they shut it down. Start looking at that. Cots, not a forward house. Your time has expired. Anybody. Truth, please come to the podium. You'll be followed by Consuelo, who will be followed by Blair B. It's all Nora's fault. All those BOS meetings. Look at this. Nor I'm offended that anyone would suggest that San Diego is a respectful or trustworthy group. I'm offended that an $87,000 flood would be called a simple accounting error. And it's offensive when certain reps pointing out rottenness are interrupted. I'm actually offended by San Diego's entire existence. But don't worry, just like Bill said, my obligation to the public is greater than my obligation not to offend you. So I'd say just like Sean at San Diego, Nora is in need of behavior change. If she can't keep herself off the edge, then I'm going to recommend a new chair. Someone like John Minto or even Bill Wells. And I say that with zero political bias. I judge only by the content of someone's character. Because real leadership means you are confident enough in your convictions to listen and consider dissenting opinions without interruption, outbursts, or steamrolling of others' voices and concerns. So, Nora, we need somebody not like her, someone who will address corruption on TV, because if they don't, it looks like a cover-up. However, if this behavioral path continues, my goal of seeing Sandag eliminated will happen. Nora fears truth. That's what I got. Your time expired. Consuelo, please come to the podium. You'll be followed by Blair B., Paul the Bold, and our final commenter, the original draw. And that's why she's not here. And corruption does not mean illegal. Anyways, uh, so people expect evil in government to appear in obvious forms, announcing itself, clearly displaying its intentions. That's what people expect. But that's not the reality. Evil in government is subversive, manipulative, tricking you into thinking that it's good and tricking you into giving them your consent. An Arabic proverb, they asked the Pharaoh, what made you a tyrant? He answered, no one stopped me.
Our next commenter, Blair B, please go ahead. Uh, I heard there may have been uh, a little more additional security today at today's meeting. Uh, I thought the way you handled December's uh, board of meetings was the right way to go. You seem to have in-person sandbag people there trying to watch over things uh, for security. I think that's a better system than uh, having to have armed security there. Good luck in continuing to stop thinking for the future security measures, which do need to be addressed. Don't doubt it, but uh, let's make it as minimal as possible. Good luck in that effort. With my remaining time, I just wanted to really, really thank you that uh, as a whole group really inspired me to think about what is uh, with the wars going on in Israel right now, how we can practice openness at the local level. I think a lot of uh, cities in the U.S. want to do that. Same with the cities of Sandeg. Um, it's important to work towards openness at this time and not fall into the uh, practices of war and secrecy to respect uh, Israel's point of view. I, I, I think dialogue and negotiation is the way to go. We're trying to do that here in this country and on our border. We're doing some awesome work with the your time expired. All the bowl, please go ahead. You'll be followed by final commenter, the original draw. Uh, Paul Bold. I think routing the train tracks up the I-15 rather than Del Mar, as I believe Mayor Krantz suggested, makes more sense than routing the trains under the Del Mar in a deep, dangerous, and super expensive tunnel. Given the need for ventilation and escape routes, it would probably ruin the fairgrounds and a lot of houses. It would also be easier to connect to other high-speed rail projects like the one to Vegas or the one to the Bay Area. Next, I agree with Mayor Bill Wills and others that we need an independent investigation. That means an outside investigation of Sendag's financial and political scandals. And here, people are furious at having one-minute speeches if they can speak at all before the closed session. A lot of questions in the wake of the corrupt previous CEOs. Your time expired. Our final comment to the original draw. Please go ahead. It's disturbing when you guys talk about behaviors because your behaviors are the ones that the people need to pay attention to. Gasterlin, as you are sitting there trying to take the toll off the roads, you want to charge vehicle miles traveled and vehicle minutes traveled. So at some point you are going to push more fees upon the people just for using the roads. And Jack Shu, you sit here and say that the road users should pay for using the road and consequences of driving like air pollution. And you also say that, you know, when you're crossing the street that a driver should stop for you. The things that you guys do is presenting mass psychosis to the people and wanting them to engage in the same. And if we don't engage in the same mass psychosis, you're going to come after the people and act like, you know, we're doing something wrong when we're trying to wake the people up to what's actually going on, that everything that you guys do is fraud, waste and abuse. And it's all a plan to get us out of our cars, period. And that's what you say. It doesn't matter if it's an electric vehicle or not. We got to get people out of their cars. So if people understood that, I don't think that they would continue to your time expired that concludes the public comments thank you very much before we go to closed session um we'll go to public comments on closed session i have two commenters on closed session truth please come to the podium actually now three and that will be all we will take Here's a UT headline. Sandag's latest scandal, one more sign of its shabby, corner-cutting internal culture. Congratulations. Andre's little ledger problem seems to have bigger implications than as presented. Drivers like Brandon Kelso and many others, plus former finance director Lauren Warren, are suing Sandag. And it doesn't surprise me because, one, tolls discriminate against the underserved, the marginalized, the poor. And the official story says that's often people of color. That means tolls are racist. And that Sandag is a system of inequitable oppression that needs to be dismantled. And two, Sandag is an oxymoron. It's not an association. It's a super government masquerading itself as a legitimate lawful government. You're all free to have an organization or a business with a CEO, but nobody here has any right to do things like tax and toll the publicly funded highways and streets. Nobody here was elected by the people to be on this board. There is no consent of the governed. It's fraud. 
And to address the elephant leg in the room, I might be part of this lawsuit against Sandag too. I tried to be green and walk because I couldn't afford the toll. And look what happened. Now I have to drive even more. Your time expired. Our next commenter, the original draw, will be followed by the final commenter, Blair B. The original draw, please go ahead. You were supposed to have an attachment on this item and it says it, there isn't one. Um, and you know, we know that the things that you guys are doing all leads to litigation, as you can tell that you were talking about things in the previous items um, that will cause for you to have litigation. But especially when you fire someone for bringing forward information about the toll roads and then you implement something saying that you're not gonna retaliate against employees for bringing a forward fraud, waste and abuse. Well, if you can't correct the previous um, firing of somebody, how would anybody think and believe that you guys are going to not do the same and retaliate against somebody who is bringing information forward? And the fact that Cardenas was even allowed to stay on the board while um, having all of these um, criminal charges come forward just shows that you guys are negligent in your decision making and aren't willing to, you know, do the right thing for the people to make sure that, you know, you're showing transparency and all of these things. It takes something in the press for you to act. Blair B, please go ahead. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman. Yeah, I felt there was something uh, a bit amiss with the closed session report today. So I felt I'd just comment that a reminder that um, in coming from the Bay Area, I've been amazingly impressed how in San Diego, uh, in the city of San Diego, it's county meetings and uh, sometimes Sandag, they give really good closed session reports and they do something really interesting with the public meeting process. There's an openness and flexibility in how they work that I find really refreshing and relaxed and helpful and it's it, it, it's conducive to good practices so good luck how the future of closed session items here at sandag can uh, you can work for them to be open and clear and understandable and to offer a, a good amount of information for people it really helps and uh it's a very great uh service to offer so i uh, thank you that you do it hope you can continue that uh, that good practice thanks and that concludes the closed session public comments very good. Okay, we're going to move into closed sessions. So those of you who should not be in here, if you would mind please exiting the room. You know who you are. Yeah, really. Okay. Non-board members or attorneys. Very good. I'm, no, you you can have it. Oh, yeah, that's fine. I think you gave us the what? I'm
Is that yes? <laughs> the mice are running in the little cages. Very good. We're back into open session. I'll ask Ms. Deaton if there's anything to report from closed session. Uh, thank you, Mayor Huebner. The board met in closed session on item number 10 and has denied the claim identified. Very good. I will now adjourn this meeting. We'll be back here January 26th at 9 a.m. Yay. Thank you.